Wanted to welcome everyone to day two of the spring meeting of the Standing Committee on Offshore Wind Energy and Fisheries. My name is Caroline Bell. I'm the uh, director for this project at the National Academies. Um, I'm on the, the Ocean Studies Board here at the National Academies and happy to um, kick us off for our second day. If we go to the next slide, I'll show the agenda. We have two panel discussions planned for this afternoon. Um, the first one is on the synthesis of the science report that came out uh, last March. Um, and then the second panel discussion after a break will be um, from the special initiative on offshore wind fisheries mitigation project. And um, we'll have plenty of time for question and answer and discussion following both of those panel um, discussions. Next slide, please. And just wanted to remind everybody that's joining um, for some meeting logistics, uh, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Uh, use the raised hand feature or the Q&A in Zoom to uh, ask questions. Um, the chat feature is also available for participants to chat with the um, panelists and committee members who are on the line. We will work to address um, committee members first in our panel discussions, but there should be plenty of time to hear from um, participants as well. Uh, so please either enter questions in the Q&A um, as we get to the Q&A portion of the meeting or raise your hand and we can call on people as there's time allowed to um, have hear from the public on questions. And then as uh, for our panelists and our committee members, when you are asking questions or presenting, we do ask you to keep your camera on um, to support a sense of community for those watching this webinar. And with that, I would like to introduce our first panel. Um, we have here with us today, Fiona Hogan, uh, Andy Lipsky, and Elizabeth Mithrata. Uh, and Brian Hooker, who all participated uh, and put, helped put together the synthesis of the science um, report and project. And I will let Fiona <laughs> share her screen with a few slides um, and looking forward to hearing more about this uh, project in the report. You're muted. There we go. Sorry, too many screens and too many tabs. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so um, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Fiona Hogan. Um, I'm the research director over at the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance. Um, I will be kicking off this presentation uh, before handing it off to Dr. Uh, Lisa Mathrata. Um, so we are representing a large team who worked on this effort, including our two other panelists today, uh, Andy Lipsky and Brian Hooker. So given the, the fast pace of offshore wind development in the US, it's important to have an understanding of the science surrounding the interactions between offshore wind and um, the marine ecosystem. Uh, with the complexity of the issue and the large scale of potential development of offshore wind energy, uh, it seemed prudent to assess what was known and, and consequently what was what remained unknown uh, about any impacts or interactions between the two industries or between offshore wind and the marine ecosystem itself. So Rhoda, um, NOAA, and Bohm, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, um, had entered into a memorandum of understanding back in 2019. Um, that was to explore uh, collaborations on issues of mutual interest. And this SOS project is a good example of, of one of those um, collaborations. So members of each organization uh, participated in the planning and execution of the SOS project uh, and helped us find additional experts to round out um, the expertise needed to pull this off. Uh, and I will note that funding was provided by um, the National Marine Fisheries Service, Services Northeast Fisheries Science Center. There we go, sorry. Um, so listed here are the objectives we developed for the SOS project. Um, we did need to assemble a team of experts um, on all the various topics uh, that we wanted to cover under this project. Uh, this did include fishing industry members and we wanted to model best practices for including their expertise in a project such as this. 
Um, then we set out to gather the available information, identify any data gaps, and then identify recommendations for future uh, collaborative work. So the SOS project itself uh, was composed of two elements, um, the first being the workshop and then a subsequent literature review. The workshop was held virtually back in October of 2020, um, and the NOAA technical memo was published in 2023. Um, as I already alluded, this was a large effort. We had just over 60 authors involved in the NOAA technical memo um, itself. So the planning team also developed a set of workshop objectives that were designed to help us maximize the um, outcomes of the workshop itself. So the workshop allowed us to uh, present the report framework um, to gain initial feedback on what we were planning while also initiating the dialogue between authors and participants. Um, we also wanted to identify constituents and groups to work with the authors um, for inclusivity, but also to make sure that we were encapsulating the broadest level of expertise possible um, so that we could uh, develop a complete list of recommendations for future research priorities. Um, and lastly, we wanted to inform and advance regional science efforts. So for the workshop, um, we hosted a series of panels and breakout sessions discussing offshore wind energy development and fisheries. This was virtual um, because of the pandemic. Um, it was held back in 2020. Um, and we had pretty decent attendance, even though it was virtual. Um, although uh, you might say that folks started to get a little tired by day three because our numbers dropped below 300, but we still did very well on attendance and participation in our breakout sessions. So recordings of the panels are still available on Rhoda's website. Um, feel free to check them out. If you have any trouble finding them, please let me know. Um, we follow the same format um, for all of our, our panels. Um, the topics covered mirrored the NOAA technical memo sections that I'll be covering uh, in a few slides. Um, we also prioritize uh, subject expertise uh, in our panelists. So we um, wanted to include um, fishing industry members, academics, um, federal and state scientists, managers, and in international experts as well. So uh, Rhoda's research program is focused primarily on cooperative research, um, and we feel like our SOS effort benefited from that approach um, because we were able to access the expertise of a number of uh, fishermen in this project. Um, we had 50 fishing industry participants involved um, in some form or other in this project. Uh, and their contributions to both the workshop and the NOAA technical memo, uh, we think were greatly received. Uh, for the tech memo, they participated by writing, providing main points or reviewing and editing their sections. Um, we didn't wanna put anybody on the spot doing something that they weren't necessarily comfortable with. So individual um, author teams were able to um, figure out um, the best way for, for that group to work together to write their section. Um, it, but we I will note that we did strive to have um, fishing industry um, representatives involved in every section of the, the report itself. So as for that report, um, we did have uh, objectives identified um, for that component of the project as well. So we primarily wanted to find and summarize all available um, information on the ecosystem, socioeconomics, fisheries management, and methods and approaches for research and monitoring. Uh, these objectives um, do mirror what I've already outlined for the overall project. Um, but specifically, we were synthesizing what was known, identifying any gaps, and um, working on research recommendations. So these are the topics covered in the NOAA technical memo. Um, we kind of started um, from the bottom up, um, working through the ec ecosystem from um, the benthic habitat up to um, the fish species themselves, uh, and then moving on to fisheries and their socioeconomics and management um, of those fisheries as well. Um, we also covered methods and approaches that include cumulative impacts and an integrated ecosystem assessment uh, and any novel monitoring techniques before finishing with regional science planning. 
Uh, here's a list of uh, the impact producing factors. Um, the majority of these topics were covered uh, in the NOAA technical memo. So for example, for the fishery species, we gathered available information regarding um, the impact of this list on individual species. Information was not necessarily available for all fish species that will overlap with offshore wind energy development and more research um, needs to be done to, to fill those gaps. But since we've published this, also more research has become available, which is is great. But um, unfortunately, being a uh, um, a moment in time, uh, the document is not being updated with um, public or uh, research published since then. So for uh, each section, uh, we tried to cover um, each of these elements on the side. We kind of figured consistency was would be key um, for a document that ended up being as large um, as it was. So for each section, uh, it can it should contain these four elements, um, which were the background, uh, major gaps, uh, commercial and recreational perspectives, and recommendations. For some of the sections, though, some of the um, fishing perspectives are embedded within um, the section, so it might not have that heading listed separately. Um, but we also, um, I'll point out, we did do two um, separate peer reviews of this document. The first round was coordinated by the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance. Um, and after any edits identified by that round were addressed, we submitted the document to NOAA um, Northeast Fisheries Science Center for another review. And before I hand it over to Lisa, I just wanted to reiterate that the fishing industry um, was involved in this project from start to finish. Uh, Rhoda is a um, fishing industry association. We All of our members are um, related to the fishing industry in some form or other, be it support business or a fishing vessel um, themselves. Um, and we were able to use that network of um, fishing industry individuals to um, pull some pull relevant expertise into this project. Um, and if our members didn't have that expertise, we were able to use their, their network to find anybody willing to um, give their time to participate in this project. And we are very much grateful for their time and expertise, uh, which helped us to produce this report. So at this point, I will hand it over to Lisa. Thank you, Fiona, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll continue this presentation just by um, talking a little bit about one of the topics that were uh, that was covered in the synthesis of the science report with a little bit more detail. Um, and the topic that I'll talk a bit more about is uh, the section on cumulative impacts. Um, this particular section was uh, led by a colleague from the United Kingdom where offshore wind is um, a bit further along than here in the US, a person who is an expert on um, uh, cumulative impacts named uh, Dr. Silvana Birkenoff and also a colleague from uh, Boehm, uh, Ian Slayton, um, both spearheaded this particular section. Uh, so cumulative impacts, as many of you may be aware, uh, evaluates the combined present, uh, past, present, and near uh, future offshore wind projects to determine an overall effect on the environment and the ecosystem. Um, and there are many challenges to trying to be able to assess the many interactions, including uh, the, the multiple developments that are uh, proposed and some which are uh, already constructed and in the water uh, in the near term. Uh, also considering the cumulative build out over time of all offshore wind projects, as well as uh, interactions with other uh, pressures and stressors on the marine ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the major gaps in knowledge uh, identified with regards to cumulative impacts were the need to understand uh, both individual um, of, uh, effects of impact producing factors at the project level, as well as their interactions, um, lacking um, um, empirical data on the interactions of uh, impact producing factors, um, both individually and with each other um, uh, requires the need to make assumptions in cumulative impact models and those assumptions impart some uncertainty into the models and their outcomes. And this is true both for um, ecological receptors uh, and environmental changes and receptors as well. 
Um, other knowledge gaps include uh, the spatial scale of effects. Um, we're still trying to learn uh, what the true uh, spatial scope of uh, impact producing factors such as uh, noise during construction and operation and um, effects of uh, wind wake effects on uh, oceanography and ocean stratification and primary production, for example. Um, there's also um, a gap in knowledge and uncertainties related uh, to things such as uh, cables and where they're going to be located, um, uh, thinking in, in terms of uh, future development, um, the construction and vessel availability, um, and also some uh, gap in knowledge related to job creation and, and port changes Did that will be needed. Elizabeth? Uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Did I fade out? Sorry about that. Um, and, and the last one I'll note, uh, major gap was identified uh, the need for developing integrated ecosystem assessments to evaluate um, cross-sector trade-offs. Uh, next slide, please. And some of the recommendations that were made, this is not a comprehensive list, just a few highlights, but you can see there's, there's quite a few listed here. Uh, some of the recommendations that were made was the need to have a better understanding and incorporate more representative spatial and temporal scales for cumulative impact assessment uh, to consider some of the new advancements in wind technology that could um, uh, potentially uh, modify some of the interactions that occur. Um, the need to have dedicated assessments um, of site-specific pressures um, and potential impacts across ecological receptors um, to gain a better understanding there. I think I've already noted uh, the need to understand the footprint of spatial and temporal scales. Um, and so this leads to the need for research uh, over uh, the long-term to understand uh, what the long-term, say 30-year impact of offshore wind development will be on the ecosystem and other interactions. Uh, further, um, the need to understand how wind development will interact with other ecosystem pressures, um, such as climate-driven impacts um, and uh, how these will affect uh, commercial species. And finally, uh, a recommendation was me made to um, conduct outreach and disseminate uh, key areas and ac activities that would need to be restricted, such as pile driving noise over fish spawning areas or nursery areas. Uh, next slide, please. So the synthesis of the science uh, was really um, an attempt and I think a success in modeling best practices for successfully engaging fishing industry, as Fiona noted, uh, in complex scientific processes and setting research and, and monitoring agendas. Um, as, as Fiona had noted, uh, fishing industry representatives were part of every section of the synthesis of the science, uh, contributing um, with their various expertise to uh, writing, editing, and reviewing uh, various uh, components of the report. And the key to the success of this project, I believe, uh, and I think most of my team members would agree, was the real cross-sectoral collaboration, uh, engagement, and open communication together with transparency across all phases of this effort. Um, and here at the bottom of this slide is the link uh, to where uh, you can gain access to the PDF of the tech memo. Next slide, please. Some key takeaways uh, include that there really are, uh, there really is a lot of uncertainty related to the interactions of offshore wind development with the marine ecosystem, with um, data collection, both fisheries dependent and fisheries independent data collection, as well as um, uh, fisheries management and socio socioeconomic interactions. There are large gaps in the science to understand uh, those interactions. And uh, we didn't talk a lot about uh, this in this particular uh, presentation, but we can talk about it perhaps in the Q&A, is the uh, impacts on scientific data collection and the uh, major adverse effects it will have on NOAA's ability to assess stocks and provide scientific advice to fisheries managers. Um, that, and you know, part of the challenge is we don't really have access to an abundant uh, long-term time series to describe offshore wind interactions um, from which to learn from um, and to, to inform uh, um, uh, our understanding of, of wind interactions uh, with, with any of those receptors. And so this leads to a need for long-term regionally standardized uh, monitoring to, to understand those interactions, both at the regional and ecosystem scales. Uh, next slide. So moving forward, some time has passed since the synthesis of the science was published. 
uh, some of the notable uh, things that have happened since our, we put our pens down uh, was the um, BOEM and NOAA Fisheries Federal Survey Mitigation Strategy for the Northeast region uh, was released and um, different elements of, of this strategy are uh, being advanced. Um, there's also a need to advance strategies in other regions as well and to implement um, uh, working through implementing survey specific mitigation plans and regional survey mitigation programs. Um, further, um, there's a need for research and monitoring at the ecosystem versus the project by project uh, level and, and some work on that is, is underway. Um, there's also a need for science to support the mitigation of impacts, uh, including research on uh, the economic impacts to commercial and recreational fisheries, uh, and also continuing our uh, collaborations, such as the international collaboration through the International uh, Council for the Exploration of the Sea or ICES working groups, including the Working Group on Offshore Wind Development and Fisheries. Uh, before I conclude, I'd just like to ask uh, Fiona and Andy if they have any uh, additional thoughts they wanted to include at this point. Uh, I'll jump in first, Andy, and then I'll hand it over to you. I would just say, um, you know, we did identify a number of um, research recommendations throughout this project, and I, I foresee a need for um, resources in order to, you know, actually come answer some of those um, research questions that that were identified. Because um, I, I do see this as a, a large long term task. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa and Fiona. This is Andy. I don't have anything else to add. It was a pretty large effort to try to cover it in 15, 20 minutes. I think we hit the, the right levels, but obviously we're here to answer any questions that the committee might have. Uh, this is, this is Brian. Uh, yeah, I agree. Andy, uh, three, three days, I think, or was it four? <laughs> Just summarize in 20 minutes. Um, I, I will, I will try to, I, I, I spent a lot of time with Ron Smolowitz on the ecosystem thing. So I know recognizing Ron as a committee member and he has a special thanks in the report. I wanted to give a shout out to Ron for his support as one of those industry members who contributed heavily uh, to, to this report. Thank you, Brian, Fiona, and Andy. Um, I think that's our last slide. And uh, I guess we'll uh, send it back to uh, Caroline and the organizers for um, the moderating discussion portion. Thank you so much. Great. <clears throat> Thank you um, all for that uh, introduction to the report. And I will turn it over now to our committee chair, Jim. Excuse me, Sanchir Sanchirico. Sanchir I can never say your last name. I apologize. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so, um, oh, I, uh, well, Steve has a question, so let's go with Steve. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I'm Steve Joner uh, with the Macaw Tribe in Washington. I, it was such a, a fast presentation, I, I may have missed it, but did you look at uh, specifically migration of uh, marine fish and uh, mammals? as they may be impacted by uh, this large array of, of towers, uh, either float, well, floating, floating towers with all their uh, cable and, and anchoring structures. And so specifically, uh, my concern or question is, uh, that's a lot of underwater structure and that could be quite an attractant for uh, various forage fish, which then could impact the, the timing and uh, and uh, distance of, of migratory species. Uh, on the West Coast, we have a uh, number of marine mammals that travel up and down the coast. And then uh, we have a number of species that originate in Southern California and move south and, and uh, somewhat vice versa. So if you looked at that, the, the impact that could have with uh, creating these uh, artificial habitats that uh, you know could change a lot in the uh, ecosystem. I can jump in on that one and then maybe open it up to my um, other co-panelists to add their thoughts as well. 
Thank you, Stephen, for the question. Um, yes, we've talked quite a bit about that. Um, in the ecosystem section of the report, there were individual sections for uh, groupings of fish, including highly migratory uh, fish species and small pelagics, uh, to name a few. And uh, those types of interactions were certainly um, of interest in the report and, and discussed uh, the potential, for example, feeding stopovers um, of migratory species, um, impacts of uh, electromagnetic fields for species that have um, highly migratory species that have um, electromagnetic sensory capabilities. Um, so uh, yes, absolutely. We did uh, think through those interactions and in incorporated into the report um, to the best we could based on uh, the information uh, that, that is available and, and mostly, you know, trying to infer what we what we uh, can based on what we know about the biology of the species and how we uh, expect they might interact um, uh, with with uh, structures as as you noted. Um, Fiona or Andy or, or Brian, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, I, I think you covered um, the majority of it. I would just say for protected species, um, I, we focus more on the management side of things as opposed to specific um, uh, you know, migratory concerns um, for that, that species. Um, but I think Lisa covered uh, elsewhere in the document where we did cover mi migration um, concerns. Thank you. Janet. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Fiona. Um, my question is sort of about the differences between this SOS report and the SOE report that's being done in conjunction with URI. There are um, a number of sort of topics that seem like uh, maybe they weren't addressed in this one. I'm thinking about kind of um, Sort of how tribes are impacted, other um, kind of fisheries adjacent communities. Um, are these topics going to be addressed in the SOE report with URI, or, or how do these two reports sort of dovetail together? And and what are sort of the new pieces that the new report is going to be touching touching on? Are you referring to the integrated ecosystem assessment that we're working on um, with the Science Center and URI? It um correct yeah excellent thank you um so uh when we were writing this document uh we were just starting the kind of planning portion of that integrated ecosystem assessment so we do describe our plans within this document um but we weren't able to describe anything further because we were um we weren't there yet um at this point that project um some information is available on Rhoda's website on it. Um, it is still ongoing. Um, for those who are not necessarily familiar with an integrated ecosystem assessment, I'm not an expert yet. I'm learning as I go. Um, but we are in the early stages of that uh, iterative uh, wheel of the um, IEA process. Um, we have held workshops with the fishing industry, developed our conceptual model. In the coming year, um, we will be advancing onto uh, indicator development and a potential uh, risk assessment that would fall in line with the typical state of the ecosystem um, report that the center works, um, I think presents to the councils, is it annually? Uh, I can never remember, sorry about that. Um, so. This project, um, the only overlap between the SOS effort and the uh, integrated ecosystem assessment is that there are similar um, team members working on both and we were able to describe it in this project. Um, I'm not sure if you have any follow-up questions. I saw Andy pop on video. I don't know whether he was just joining the video fun or whether you had a response to. Thanks. I guess. I guess just to clarify my question, is what you've identified some gaps in this SOS report. 
Is this IEA intended to address some of those gaps? Where do you see the gaps in this report? And then what is the IEA sort of picking up from, from this report? It, it seems to be the, you know, kind of the next block in the building. What are you hoping that that's going to be able to add? Because there are some pieces that are missing from this report, and I'm assuming that you're going to be more comprehensively looking at these in the next iteration. So maybe could you just kind of describe that transition from this to that and what's missing in here and what you hope to add in the next phase? So um, I, I guess I'm not viewing them as the um, IEA being a, a second phase of the SOS report. Okay. It, it, I'm viewing it as an independent project. Um, and yes, it. we're hoping that it can um, the IEA could improve our understanding of the interactions between the two industries. It's focused on the Gulf of Maine. Um, it will, basically we are trying to um, set up um, a system where we can track changes in various indicators over time that won't necessarily answer all of the research questions that we're, we've identified in SOS, because it's not necessarily um, going to answer, say, the migratory um, question specifically of what species are um, sensitive to changes uh, in their migration patterns. But within um, the realm that we're looking at, we could look at, say, uh, an easy example would be landings of X species over time. Um, and are there any changes in that? Or is there a change in uh, temperature? Um, anything along those lines that we can easily track over time. Um, it, the IEA is more to understand impacts. Um, it may be get at some of the socioeconomic um, gaps in our knowledge. Um, so hopefully that that helps a little bit more. I, and I'll turn to, I don't know whether um, any of the other panelists want to jump in and help me out there. Andy's got his hand raised, so Andy will go first. I did, I, I was going to try to have my own perspective, but Andy, go first. Yeah, they're, I would say they're completely separate efforts that have a relationship in terms of the gaps or um, that are identified in the, since the science, I mean, it was basically a virtual effort to conduct a uh, literature review. What do we know? What do we don't know? What do we think we need to know? And the IEA effort is more of an applied effort focused on a place, which is the Gulf of Maine, which is subject to uh, future uh, pending leasing. Um, so that would be, and then the gaps we need to, the gaps that we identified in the SOS um, some of them are being filled. Lisa, um, Lisa highlighted a few of them there that are, you know, the, the, at the time, the issues of impacts on NOAA fishery surveys were, um, were just being described and evaluated through the NEPA uh, assessments and analyses. And now we actually have a, a joint NOAA BOEM strategy to, uh, you know, our approach to how we're going to mitigate those impacts on our surveys. So we're that that's happening, but a lot, a lot of the gaps, the research gaps identified in the, in the uh, SOS report, just require us to invest in research and monitoring, um, to understand those uh, mechanistic understanding of stressors and receptor responses. So, the IEA is is a very different uh, different beast that I think we Fiona did a pretty good job describing. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, no, really, that's what I was really going to reiterate is, is like, you know, the state of science says, you know, some broad, broad categories. These are the kinds of things that we're looking at. Here's what some of the science says. But the IEA is, is, as you said, trying to really get into that quantitative, you know, indicator. Can we measure, you know, what are the what are the expected cause effect relationships to be able to then, you know, you know, set up a, a program that might be able to detect whatever changes those are. So it's a, a much more technical, I don't want to call the technical state of the science report, not technical, but um, I think the IEA process is is uh, definitely more uh, technical in, in, in terms of really trying to quant uh, quantitatively assess those uh, cause effect pathways and, and uh, the, the indicators. Thanks. Andy, did you want to follow up? 
No, I think we I think we covered it. I just need to learn how to move on my hand. <laughs> All right, we could figure that out for you. So I do want to bring in a question from the Q and A from the general audience. There's two of them really that sort of uh, touch on this. So the question is, you know, what kind of engagement and consultation was done with the tribes during the drafting and peer review process? I'll open it up to any one of you. Uh, we, for SOS1, um, we focused primarily on the, the fishing industry, um, so we did not have um, tribal represented, representation um, in, in that iteration. Um, we are working on a uh, second round of, of uh, SOS focused on floating technology, um, so there may be opportunity to uh, broaden our um, participation. To other groups um but for sos1 um we did not have travel uh involvement can i just follow up i'm sure that people would like to know why that decision was made at the time I wouldn't say that it was an explicit decision to exclude anybody. Um, we were so focused on uh, our objectives and, and um, that I, I think it was just an, an oversight that we, we knew we needed the fishing industry involved, um, but we didn't take it beyond that. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I would just I would just note the 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 effort as Fiona described it was a joint effort, but it was a grant from NOAA Fisheries to Rhoda to conduct a basically a literature review and do it as a workshop. It was not um, you know federal agencies like uh, NOAA Fisheries and BOEM have you know distinct and specialized relationships, government to government consultations, and how we work with tribes. And the focus of this effort was to conduct a review of fisheries interactions um, from offshore wind energy, and it, it was let out as a grant. In terms of the processes that either BOEM or NOAA utilizes to engage tribes, obviously we, you know, consultation is important, and, and we approach this with a government-to-government -government, uh, approach. But this this effort was a grant to to Rhoda. They implemented the grant, which was to conduct a basically a review of what do we know, what do we don't know about fisheries interactions with offshore wind energy development. That was the focus of the effort. I know Brian, if you want to, no, I was going to say the work, yeah, it. on the on the workshop itself, it was a public workshop. I mean, it wasn't there was no, you know, uh, you know it was it was available to to anyone, uh, you know, to to participate in. Um, and you know there were industry leaders. I think there was a heavy Atlantic focus uh, because that's where the bulk of the work was occurring back in 2020. And um, you know that's recognized the the expertise in that area at that time. Thanks. Any other questions from the committee members? All right, then I'll, there is another question that popped in that I, I will uh, put forth. What recommendations did you make regarding needed in needing independent acoustic monitoring and biological monitoring in place before, during, and after high resolution geographic survey work? So pretty particular question. I'd have to dig in. I don't don't know. I, I remember we might have gotten into uh, acoustics from uh, surveys, but I think the focus was probably construction noise, um, if I recall from that that session. Um, but uh, so I think that that might have been what the focus was. But I can you could probably research. I don't know, Lisa, if you have a, <laughs> have a recollection of of that that chapter in particular. Yeah, I think like you, Brian, I'd have to go back and dig into the details. There's a a section toward the end of the report uh, called Innovative Methods and Approaches uh, in which 
uh, potential monitoring technologies were um, discussed. So that is where I would go to look for details uh, on that particular uh, topic. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure it's I have a, a, a great answer right off the top of my head for that one. Yeah, I mean, we could dig into it. I, it's a fairly lengthy report, and I, I do know that that is that has been highlighted as a, an area of research understanding, is understanding what the interactions of, of um, you know, pre-construction activities may have on uh, marine ecosystem receptors. Um, there's some knowledge of uh, in terms of fisheries. Again, this, the focus of this was on fisheries. Um, you know, as we are... We're looking at actually looking at this question, uh, hopefully down at the CVAL project, uh, looking at uh, potential interaction of noise on on uh, fish species um, down in the mid-Atlantic region uh, from the construction of uh, the CVAL 2 project on the the animals that are utilizing the CVAL 1 turbines. Um, and we are actually interested in, in seeing and testing um, and measuring potential behavioral effects from so it's it's not something that wasn't um excluded from the the sos report there's there's just a lot of questions that's one of many ron oh you're muted ron okay you have that better I think the key question uh, component of that last question was independent. Okay, are there any independent surveys? I mean, it's always being funded by the government, which is an advocate, state governments, which are advocates, the wind industry, advocates. Are there any independent surveys? Maybe help help me with that ron you mean independent observations like uh, acoustic mon independent acoustic monitoring and i don't know if i'd agree with that you know bohm and, and and nymphs are are advocates um for offshore wind but is that is that what you're asking is it is it a acoustic uh well let's look monitoring? at the acoustic issue okay the, the the impact uh seismic impact on uh whales or or on shellfish who's uh who's doing that in other words who would who would end up funding a project to look at the impact of seismic uh sub bottom profiling on on shellfish yeah um Again, I mean, I think, I mean, speaking from the BOEM perspective, um, you know, I, a lot of, you know, the, most of the acoustic energy that we're seeing uh, from these projects are from, from pile driving. So we have focused our, um, our at least on the BOEM, BOEM side, focused the research efforts on the acoustic effects from, from pile driving. Um, and again, that was done um, both through uh, work with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and and even with the National Marine Fisheries Service Northeast Fisheries Science Center at uh, the J.J. Howard Lab. Uh, that uh, I think in my presentation yesterday I actually gave um, a link to a recently completed report from some of the, the tank-based studies, and we're actually working on wrapping up um, an in situ study uh, with uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute that actually and they just published recently. On some of the effects uh, they saw from pile driving with uh, uh, clam um, scallops, um, but that, that was somewhat subsidized by the Bowen project, looking at uh, black sea bass and and squid um, up there. So I I don't I don't have a specific study uh, that we funded um, the Bo again speaking for Bohm that evaluated uh, high resolution geophysical survey sources. But generally, those are much lower than uh, the uh, acoustic, uh, what, what's introduced in, acoustically in the environment from pile driving. Yeah, no, I, I mean, obviously, you're funding the CFF project looking at seismic impact on leatherbacks. 
Okay, but it is funding a lot of research, which is probably objective. But I'm just reading into the, the question and plus listening to conversations, there's a lot of concern that anything funded by the government or the wind companies is not independent. And I'm just thinking that that's the yeah. that needs I, to be. I think this is a, is a good a good discussion because, uh, you know, and, and thanks for, you know, bringing that perspective, because I, I if, if it's not the government or, or uh, you know, even, you know, contractors to the government or con independent contractors to the lessees, which again, the lessees are, I, I, I can't think of a, a you know, maybe a few situations where it's actually a, a lessee doing the work rather than contracting out that that work to a, a independent contractor. Um, I don't know who's who's left <laughs> to to do the work. Uh, I, you know, so by 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 you know, it's going to mess a farm. You know, because you you have received federal funds, is, or, or do you, would you consider yourself, uh, you know, the, the research results you have as being compromised? Well, I, again, I don't, the, the term is independent. I'm not stressing that it's compromised, but, you know, in this uh, era of uh, concern, um, I think later on at the, uh, after the compensation presentations, we, we have time for a discussion. And I would like to discuss that general issue of perception. Um, you know, the bottom line is this, uh, SOS report was very good identifying scientific needs, but one of the things I, I think we're, so, we're nowhere near conducting the amount of sampling that's necessary. And if, in fact, the fishing industry could be brought in in a lot, uh, a larger role of collecting information and data, then we start getting to the point of uh, getting buy-in and, and dealing with the concern about uh, objectivity and independence in, in the scientific information. But maybe we could discuss that later. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Steve, I think you're next. Too many things to click on. <laughs> so um, I, if if any of you were on uh, yesterday's uh, webinar, you heard me say this, so I won't I won't fully repeat it. But I made uh, quite extensive comments about what the tribes on the West Coast believe as a a failure by Boehm to uh, really work as a partner with the tribes in this, and uh, how how late they were in in getting together with the tribes. So. Uh, I guess just to tell you that um, if you do any additional work on this, it is critically important to involve the tribes, involve them as early as possible. And uh, uh, on the West Coast, uh, I'm 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 actually attending the Pacific Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting this week, and there are are 26 tribes with fishing rights uh, that engage with the Pacific Fishery Management Council. I know there are tribes on the East Coast. Uh, that have concerns about this. So, uh, you know, that's something that you, you, you can't, uh, you can't forget to do, you know, really have to include those, uh, uh, go into an area, you really need to determine which tribes are there. And then, uh, you need to ask the tribes what their concerns are. How will the tribes be impacted? Because only the individual tribe can answer that. Uh, so, and then, uh, Yesterday, uh, when we had the, the description of uh, the shared responsibility between Boehm and Bessie, uh, I also made this comment that you know Bessie should be involved at this at this stage. Uh, I understand that they will, uh, the Boehm will hand off oversight of uh, these uh, turbines once they're uh, constructed, and uh, so. Bessie really needs to be involved since they will be the federal agency providing oversight. And um, I don't know how many, uh, how much offshore wind energy uh, was anticipated when when you started on your uh, your report, but um, currently the state of California has expressed uh, uh, interest, a goal of uh, at least twenty gigawatts. And um, 
you think about the number of turbines that would be uh, needed to produce 20 gigawatts. As I understand, the the, the latest, uh, most, uh, uh, the ones with the greatest uh, energy capacity are uh, about 15 megawatts. So uh, do the math and that's uh, around 1300 turbines just off the coast of California. So to me, that really changes the whole dynamic. It really changes what we're dealing with. And so I think uh, anything that's uh, investigated as to uh, cumulative impacts has to do it uh, with that view in mind that there could be that many. So that would be probably, I don't know, the the number of miles from uh, the southernmost uh, uh, wind area in, in California up to uh, Coos Bay, Oregon. It must be five or 600 miles. So that'd be a turbine every, at least every half a mile if they were spread out like that. So uh, to me, that's uh, uh, just a tremendous alteration of the ecosystem. And um, I, I, I think you need to view it with uh, the potential of having that change to the ecosystem. Does anybody want to respond to Steve's comments? I mean, what was in this is the your report with regards to the scale of the operations? What how did I, you frame it when you were having those conversations? I would um I would respond to to Stephen and thank you for your comments. The the focus of the SOS report was on the northeast region. So I think even at the time was the Gulf of Maine, the Gulf of Maine uh leasing had announcement may not have I'm not sure of the timing, Brian. You might know. We might not. Yeah, have no, that. yeah not even. I, I remember debating whether or not we even have too much of a, enough information for the West Coast. I, I remember back in 2020, yeah. it yeah. was even the West Coast was was not even, you know, fully the, the the level of activity was not fully understood even you know back in in 2020 four years ago. Yeah, but the the clearly in 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 Lisa and Fiona's presentation, Stephen clearly. Um, there's recognition from the report of the need um, to avoid what happened in Europe, where we um, didn't have integrated uh, monitoring across projects following standardized methods with very specific questions, even though we've had development for 30 years, um, where we could answer questions about cumulative effects um, across areas. Because that, and so our this report is very. Um, in, in my mind, very clear the need to avoid those issues. And, um, you know, it, in the Northeast region, I think we're, you know, we're looking at a few thousand or more, 35, depends on the, depends on the day and the, 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 the type of turbine we're thinking about. But, you know, the estimate based on development is in the EISs that are being evaluated for cumulative impact analysis. It's, it's in a 3,400 range, which is, um, you know, probably larger than the scale we thought when we were developing the synthesis science. But I think the, the report is very, it, you know, it echoes your suggestions of understanding the, the need to understand these effects, whether they're positive. Um, you know, some of these, that's just, you know, the key thing when we're talking about interactions, interactions and the impact, some of them can be negative depending on your receptor. Some of them can be positive depending on your receptor, but not understanding what 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 is happening to a stock or habitat uh, in, increases uncertainty, which we want to avoid. Um, and being able to understand change across space in time where development is happening is 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 extremely poor, important. Um, and the, in my mind, the report does a fairly good job outlining the need for that. And that was one of Lisa's takeaways: is the need for um, understanding ecosystem level responses. Clearly, the international scientific community is in that is in that space as well. The International Council of Exploration of the Sea just released a offshore renewable energy roadmap um, that highlights the need to understand um, the, some of the larger um, the the impacts from these lar the larger scale developments that are now uh, proposed.
Thanks. Dan, you had your hand up, but then dropped it. Are you? Uh, I'm, I don't know if you can hear me. I think I'm having Wi-Fi difficulties. That's, that's important here. Um, well, feel free to drop it in the chat and I can ask it for you if you want, if you're worried about your sound it, issues. It's, it's less of a question and just more of a couple of uh, linked comments based on this conversation. First of all, Elizabeth, Fiona, Andy, Brian, thank you. Um, I think this was a fantastic uh, report. Um, I, I noticed, Fiona, you mentioned it and referred to it as SOS 1. So that that makes me think maybe it was an SOS 2 coming along. And I'd love to take the opportunity to hear the author's uh, viewpoints on um, what was missed. You know the 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 impact on the fisheries services uh, sampling timeline was was a big deal at, at at that time. So so that is at least addressed. Um, it hasn't been solved, but it's been addressed. What what I'd, I'd love to hear what you think the big the big uh, the big topics or the big headlines for a, a potential SOS two would be. Second comment is. You know, and Andy, uh, it's good to see you. And 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 you know, I you you mentioned you know trying to learn from the quote unquote the mistakes of Europe or or what what how it happened in Europe without that standardization for monitoring. I think that's really a nice thread to pull on. And and you know, I know that as scientists, as developers, as a community, as scientists, we we would we would love to have a set of performance standards. This is what needs to be monitored. And 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 let let's like let's start feeding data to the regulators and decision makers and the council. Uh, so all for that and would just push to put out some standards. Say this is what we need. Um, and and then to Ron's point, uh, and again hoping you can still hear me, um, I think the best defense we have for independent, credible science is peer review you know so so wherever we can take our findings wherever they are funded from funding's an incredibly elusive thing fiona mentioned that as well um funding's funding can come from any source just as long as the results are are peer reviewed and 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 disseminated where they can um that's that's how we have independent uh assessment and trust in that data so Again, great presentation. Thank you all. Um, there wasn't really but just just beyond the gap. Like what 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 would you what would you say are the headlines for if you were to do this again? Um, what what do you think we need to be focused on? Thank you. I don't mind starting us off on that one. Um, so as we were developing. Um, the report and, and workshop that we've presented here today, we, we kind of realized that uh, most of the available data or research was uh, focused on fixed turbine technology. Uh, and it would be kind of a strain on uh, all the, the writing teams involved to kind of tack on floating as another section. So the, I don't know that I necessarily have any like uh, expected uh, groundbreaking headlines for SOS2, but that effort will be focused on floating technology. Um, it likely will be, um, we're, we're still in the, um, we're still working on it. Uh, we, we've had uh, some delays with um, uh, staff um, health issues, which I won't go into, um, but uh, we're hoping to still follow the same format in terms of a, a public workshop um, that will be held virtually uh, and a, a subsequent literature review. I do expect it to be smaller just um, for the fact that there aren't um, a large number of uh, floating uh, systems in existence uh, to date. I think we're up to two. Um, two floating systems somewhere on the planet. I think one's in Scotland and I can never remember where the other one is. Um, so uh, I just expect less information to be available on terms of 
you know, specific interactions between any one species and uh, floating technology, just because the opportunity to study that might be a little uh, lower, given that we don't have many uh, current installations. Um, but I'll hand it over to any of the other panelists if they have anything to add. I was just going to say something to Dan's comment about peer review, and I want to stress that that's probably why it took from 2020 to 2023 to get, to get that out, is because it did it did go through a lot of, of both internal review and, and peer review to be released as a NOAA technical memorandum. Uh, so that's uh, potentially one, one downside of, of the peer review is that, you know, people, you know, re responsibly, even, even now, like, we have two projects, you know, uh, that could... That just finished last summer where's the data and it's like it takes it takes some time to you know analyze that data uh, synthesize the data and then and then you know publish that publish that data and i, I you know wish that there was a, a a quicker way to to make make information available um but it is a it is a process uh to to do that Yeah, I'll throw in a, a couple of comments. Uh, thank you for your uh, notes and comments, Daniel. Um, I think uh, I think one of my big takeaways from this whole uh, S SOS one, as sometimes we affectionately call it, was just the great deal of uncertainty we have around our scientific understanding. So, um, uh, but you know, we put our pens down probably two or three years ago, and so um, you know, science is. Uh, emerging on some of the topics we already highlighted. As Fiona said, we can't capture everything up until the very last moment that the um, report comes out. Um, as Brian said, it took quite some time to do a thorough and well-vetted peer review um, effort. So, you know, digging into whatever the existing emerging sciences up, up to the day uh, would be wonderful to know. Um, I definitely feel your comment about uh, the need for um, monitoring standards to understand regional scale impacts at this, at really the scales that our populations and stocks occur over, because those are uh, the most meaningful biological scales to consider. And as part of the uh, federal survey mitigation strategy that NOAA Fisheries and Boehm have um, put out in, uh, I think, 2022, um, development of, of those standards is, is part of that um, federal survey mitigation strategy. Um, and another thing I would note, um, you know, uh, once we have uh, those standards in place, uh, you know, developing um, analytical methodologies to integrate uh, data across data sets across wind projects and with other um, regional data sets will be key to addressing some of those larger scale questions. And then, of course, also. Um, with the amount of science that we hope to have done that is going on and hope to have aspirationally, uh, we'll, we'll need um, uh, to develop uh, approaches to storing those data, um, sharing those data and disseminating them to um, the folks who are interested in, in seeing those data and understanding their interpretations. Eric, I think you had a comment or did you drop your hand? Okay. Oh, there's no sound, Eric. We can't hear you. All right. You can always put something in the chat if you want, if there's something, if your sound's not working. Caroline, I think you had a question you wanted to ask. Um, yes, thank you. Um, this was a, a great presentation and a great extensive report. And I guess I'm curious, um, as you were developing it and, and going through the process, is there a specific audience in mind for, you know, who's going to act on these recommendations and any sort of priority prioritization in, you know, you know, what recommendation needs to be acted on first as you're going through and, and identifying these gaps um, and kind of getting to this. Is there something that this committee, this group can um, help as we, we think about our future meetings and future topics that we discuss as um, my committee of experts here um, to help move forward some of these priorities and, and, and um, uh, you know, ways that we can mitigate some of the gaps in the, this uh, fisheries and offshore wind. Andy, did you want to respond to her question? Yeah, that's why I was raising my hand. Am I doing that okay? Yeah, you're good. Thanks. Yeah, so the the effort was uh, 
a, a, a multi-partnership effort. And I don't, we, um, we did when it was completed, you know, no fisheries, even though we were members of the team, we reread it and edge matched the report against our um, authorities, our trust resources. And uh, Lisa um, led as a first author a paper um, that myself and a few others at NOAA Fisheries, particularly in the Northeast region. I think we also had uh, Lisa Pfeiffer, who's an economist from uh, Northwest Fishery Science Center. We published a paper outlining, um, you know, priorities that we think need to be filled to address interaction with fisheries. And we are um, still refining it. There's more priorities than there are shekels um, available, but um, the resources that we do get um, to address uh, offshore wind science needs, you know, we're, we're implementing that. Um, the, the one thing that we are looking to do is developing a Northeast research plan uh, for the science center, um, to, you know, the, to make sure and make sure it's adaptable. The paper we wrote, we wrote it a few years ago. There's probably a few things in there that we have been able to act on some things that, um, uh, would likely have to modify, but we need sort of a living, probably a living, uh, research, uh, plan, um, to, uh, answer those questions of what is, you know, what are, what are the needs? What are the priorities? Um, there are very many priorities, um, I'll, I would leave that there. I don't know if Lisa or Brian, uh, you want to add something? Brian's environmental studies program, for instance, yeah, goes I, through the processes every year. Yeah, that, that it, well, I think more, more to Carolyn's question, you know, do I see this committee being helpful on the prioritization? Yes, I, I think that's, especially like informed prioritization. You know, we've, we've, I've gone through several iterations of like, you know, yes, everything's important. Yes, I know everything's important, but we do have limited funds with which we have, um, with, with, which we can operate. And and so having, you know, uh, you know, some recommendations on where priority areas are that are achievable within the budget is 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 a challenge. But I think that's I, I think I would you know um, like the committee's um, you know, input in that. Um, you know, we could definitely dig into some of how the environmental studies program at BOEM has uh, tried to take some of the recommendations from the state of the science, you know, and applied it over the past few years. Um, and again, it's a chat. If you read the state of the science, there's, there's a lot of questions and uncertainties, but how to even develop a study to answer that is in and of itself kind of a challenge and almost needs a study in and of itself. Like, okay, how do we answer this? And I, I think there's, probably some examples that Andy and I could share of like, you know, workshops on how to, how to actually get to the point of knowing what to do next. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think there is an opportunity there. And I, I don't know if that was a, a good segue, Caroline, into the next agenda topic or, or if there was maybe more, <laughs> more on that. Um, no, thank you both. That was, that was very helpful. Um, and yeah, as committee members, as we listen to these discussions, it's always kind of thinking about, um, you know, what ways um, as, as, you know, we as a group can be beneficial to kind of moving the needle and, and, uh, you know, uh, so, advancing the science, I guess, among other issues. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, Brian, we've kind of just went into the next session sort of automatically in, in the Q&A, but I do want to really for my own knowledge, how much are you guys tapping in or connecting to all the other and funding sources around renewable energy at energy department of energy or tapping into partnerships with nsf to try to you know rather than sort of passively or just you know fund these research with i work with noaa i know that noaa doesn't have a lot of research money in, in fisheries or within your office brian so like how how are you connected and maybe talk a little bit about that to expand that capacity. Yeah, uh, no, that's something that we do, um, you know, in, informally um, and formally. We have like, you know, formal programs like the National Ocean Partnership Program or, or NOP that we um, can get together on. You know, we we uh, work closely with the Department of Energy. I think uh, Ron uh, Smolowitz a minute ago was alluding to a, a joint project that we have with the Department of Energy, the BOEM, 
uh, contribution to that is relatively small compared to what Department of Energy is able to uh, to bring to the table. Um, so it, there, we we leverage as much as we can because we know we have a fairly small uh, research budget compared to uh, the you know the Department of Defense, Navy in particular, and the Department of Energy. I, I would say between those two, um, those are the two agencies we probably partner with most from a, a funding perspective, our biggest partner from a uh, service provider perspective, I would say would be National Marine Fishery Service where, uh, you know, we're, we're oftentimes probably the funding, they're, they're doing a lot of in-kind contributions, you know, from their staff and, um, and other assets. But uh, we're always looking to, you know, stretch our dollars. Yeah, James, I would just add, Brian, I think that was an excellent response. Um, I think we spend a lot of our time doing that, you know, collaboration. What what area, what are, how do our different research interests align? Who has resources to do what? Um, relative to the federal survey mitigation strategy, I think there's an actually action that calls out uh, the federal agencies to develop uh, like a joint resource plan for how we're going to to implement survey mitigation where we're advancing efforts right now uh, because that that strategy talks about um, it's a joint responsibility of the federal government and developers to mitigate impacts on our surveys and we we have very active uh, collaborations with with uh, the developer community on how how we're going how to proceed and design programs to uh, to address the the needed uh, the needed uh, investments in uh, mitigation of long-term recurring surveys, whether they're fisheries or protected species. So it, it is happening. It takes time. Um, as a federal employee, it's not, you know, it's illegal for me to uh, advocate for uh, funding or resources that's out of, not allowed to do that, um, that's in the bin of you get in trouble for. Um, but we are often, you know, answering questions about what our needs are. And uh, we know, you know, the needs that we're able to fill with the resources we have and working across other federal agencies and states as well um, in some of the not, you know, the uh, non-governmental organizations, whether it's RODA or the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, which brings uh, multiple sectors together uh, to coordinate on monitoring um, or the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative, which does um, fairly uh, analogous work. Um, it is it is a challenge. We have some states that are uh, uh, that are generating research dollars from their power purchase agreements. Um, you know, New York, New Jersey are good examples of that. And we are in um, conversations with those states um, to the extent that we can um, help them make wise research and monitoring investments. Thanks, Andy. So maybe we should make it explicit that we are actually have moved into the Q and A and thinking about future uh, potential meeting topics. And so I, you know, maybe the we can ask the panelists if they have ideas coming from the report that they could now. I mean, we might have said it already, but let's maybe restate it and put it up front. All right, Dan, I didn't get a response from the the speaker, so go ahead. Oh no, I'll 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 yield my time to this to to the panelists. Oh, sorry. I <laughs> I didn't realize I thought that was to the committee. That was to I, us. I did, I did too. I was, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe I misspoke. I was hoping to start with the panelists. Maybe I said committee when I meant panelists. All right, so can you uh, yeah, maybe ask the question one more time. Maybe I, I missed what, missed so what you were trying to ask. We are the next session, right? Yeah. Was discussion of future future potential meeting topics, and we have been sort of talking about them in and amongst the Q and A already. But I wanted to give you guys another opportunity to maybe raise some issues that follow on from the state of the science or the conversation we've had, and then then Dan, I'll go to you to to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's. I mean, again, from my perspective, from the Bone perspective, as a sponsor of, of this of this committee, um, you know, I think the, you know, 
having that fisheries focus of like, you know, okay, we, we know there's a lot of important things out there, um, you know, whether or not it's, you know, you know, uh, you know, communities or, or uh, protected resources, but, you know, really kind of focusing on some of the fisheries issues, whether it's, you know, through this state of the science uh, report, or even maybe some other emerging issues that are, that are coming up to, to say, you know, hey, what do we know about this? You know, has the, um, has our understanding of this, you know, improved to the point, do we still need to, to uh, devote some study to that and, and making, you know, giving some feedback on where you see, uh, you know, uh, some priority areas, some like th three, you know, priority areas uh, from where, uh, from, from your perspectives that you bring as a, as a committee would be, would be great. Um, I mean, outside of the study aspect too, I think, you know, there's, um, you know, I, I know I'm interested in, you know, uh, you know, kind of feedback on just how different how other aspects of the offshore renewable energy program are, are communicated. Uh, we have a, we're going to be talking about fisheries uh, mitigation, you know, later on this afternoon. I think that's another area that, um, you know, providing that, uh, providing that feedback, you know, seeing what's, um, you know, occurring on the ground uh, will be, you know, beneficial for this uh, committee to be able to contribute. Um, so I'll pause there. Ron? <clears throat> the, the idea of peer reviewing the science is very good. But I've heard that uh, a lot of the contracts issued by the developers to the companies that are doing their monitoring surveys restrict their use and dissemination of the data. I think we need to find out if that, in fact, is the case. <clears throat> if, in fact, the data, obviously data collected under a government-funded project, BOEM, NIMS, DOE, is, becomes public. But if the data collected from the wind companies remains confidential or ends up getting uh, washed, if you will, before it's made public, then we're losing a major source of, uh, of the data that we need to evaluate what's going on. So I, I think that's an important issue that um, needs to be looked at. Um, and then there's certain data streams that we don't even have access to. If you remember, Brian or even Carolyn, a year ago, I talked about wanting to know where the transects were, where sub-bottom profiling occurred because of the reports we were getting about dead shellfish. <clears throat> and that data is still not available. Um, so there's data that uh, is collected but is, is not available for independent analysis. Great, thank you, Ron. I think we can put that on our, our list. I think that's pretty important um, moving forward. Dan, do you wanna? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'll respond to, to Ron's point, you, you know, I, in my roles, in industry, I, I've, my teams go out and collect that data, Ron, you, you know, and, and we're very familiar with what is delivered to BOEM and to all of the consulting federal agencies and, and state agencies. So the, the, the data is out there and it's going to the regulators. So I think it, it kind of raises that question of, you know, we, you know, we trust the regulatory process in many of our lives and environments you know we, we we trust the council process to manage our 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 fisheries responsibly we trust the fishery science centers to you know propose and develop and and synthesize the best available science to feed to the council process um we've got some great uh e examples you know ron that you're 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 you pioneered you know with the research set aside for for the scallop uh, area, that that was a that was a great success, you know, and I and I, I think that there are 
there's there's plenty of a play there's plenty of playbook uh successful playbook that we could be looking at as to how to address some of these concerns so i and i'm confident we can get there i will i'll go back to that comment about um standards if we if we knew a performance standard you know we 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 don't tell we don't tell the research community how to measure buoyancy in the ocean we tell you know we 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 say we want this parameter and they can choose from one of 10 ctds that can collect that data um i i you know and and i'm not i'm i'm, I'm kind of veering away from acoustic impact so i won't i'm not i'm not saying that but but a standard of these are the 10 types of data that the that the regulatory community would like to see provided from the developers I think they would welcome that. I, I I think that there's a there's there's a little bit of a sense that the goalposts move during every consultation. Um, so that's that's something that I would like to see as a committee member. I'd like to see some some response from the consulting agencies. You know, we, we, when is what what's the standard and and what is sufficient. Uh, because I think the definition of sufficiency, as we read the NEPA documents, I think that, I think that gets interpreted by individuals slightly differently. So, um, that's yeah, just that's that's a comment. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Dan. Elizabeth, you wanted to. Uh, yeah, just follow on. Um... Daniel's comment, I think uh, Andy put it in the chat that um, as part of the federal mitigation uh, strategy, um, uh, as a particular objective number, uh, 2.1.2 is, is essentially to, to accomplish that goal, which is to develop monitoring standards. Um, and, and that is a, a process that has, uh, has started at the, at the Science Center uh, at, early de development phases uh, for fisheries resources, uh, for pr protected species, for habitat, um, and for socioeconomics, for which there is um, no clear um, monitoring approach methodology or standard uh, available. Um, I, I think um, that's a, a great question that we're being asked, right? What should be our priorities? Um, and that there have been so many prioritization exercises. I think uh, almost every regional um, science entity has put forward uh, a science prioritization, and um, every new one aggregates all prior prioritization exercises into their own, <laughs> uh, looking at it through the lens of of their um, entity's objectives. You know what should be the priorities. I think when we wrote, um, put together that paper, a bunch of us at the Science Center uh, that came back, came out maybe last year, um, we did that exact same exercise. And I think we, we uh, resisted putting numbers even to enumerate them uh, for, because we, we didn't want to dissuade anyone from looking at priority number 17, just because it happened to be alphabetically number 17, you know, in a table, um, because people come with a variety of expertise and, um, and uh, interest in, in pursuing uh, different topics. Um, but I think, you know, just, uh, you know, not speaking for anyone other than myself, I think um, would love to see the advancement of uh, methods and technologies and, and approaches that really start to get at these um, regional scale questions in uh, population uh, stock level change that are uh, pretty challenging to address with that um, project by project approach to sampling and, and monitoring. And that that um, is sort of the, the goal that I think maybe Daniel, you were uh, talking about, you know, having those standards uh, is informative for the folks who are charged with carrying out the monitoring, but it also allows um, uh, people who are charged with analyzing data and, and integrating data sets across projects looking at regional and ecosystem level change to be able to utilize those data sets in, in meaningful ways and uh, draw interpretations across across projects um, at, at those larger scales that are more meaningful to uh, the species that uh, at least you know fisheries is, is charged with managing and, and conserving 
and also uh, the fisheries communities, fishing communities that um, are, are members of this system as well. Uh, so, you know, those are, that's sort of a, a broad scope of, of topics sort of in there, you know, methods, approaches, and technologies um, to, to advance um, our regional and ecosystem level understanding. Uh, but I, I think um, there's, there's certainly a need uh, to think about questions at that scale. Great, thank you. So this question has come up a number of times in the Q&A, and I know it's sort of going to push you guys maybe beyond uh, your comfort zone, but I'm curious, to me, the angle I'm trying to understand is, again, goes back to something I asked yesterday with regards to the feedback processes from what you guys are learning and how does that feed into the next one? And, and this is, you know, the question really about, is there any concern about the speed at which we're implementing these projects is occurring in light of the gap of the science that we have? Um, and what role does that development of science play in monitoring and managing the next sort of implementation? And so, you know, this has come up a number of times and it's really, to me, is that feedback loop, right? You're, we're going forward, how much of that learning and then incorporated into the next process. And so what, how do you guys, you know, sleep at night thinking about how fast everything is versus all these gaps that we have and um, doing your best to ensure that it's incorporated in the next round of considerations, whether it's EISs or whatever it is um, in the process. I mean, I, I think, you know, I always like to start with, you know, and I think Andy, Andy even alluded to it earlier, you know, the, the 30 years from Europe. I mean, it's, it, we, although in the U.S. Atlantic, we have uh, only uh, uh, now uh, two, uh, two pilot projects, the Black Island and the Coastal Virginia Offshore Research Project and South and the first commercial project, the South Fork Wind Farm, fully constructed and partial project for Vineyard we're still building on that legacy of like a lot of other structures in, in, um, in Europe. We have lots of experience with oil and gas structures in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so it's not, we're not at ground zero, um, but you know, we are, you know, continuing to build off the, the, you know, our own Atlantic based uh, studies that we did with, with Block Island and, and CVAO, um have, you know, Conducted both, uh, you know, project-specific studies that um, were, were done by the the lessees for both of those projects, and you know, our own independent, independent from the lessee uh, projects like the, uh, I'll highlight the rodeo uh, project that we have committed for both Seavow uh, and and the Block Island Wind Farm. So we we do continue to update and you know look at you know what we're seeing at those projects to not only our environment environmental review but you know potential mitigation measures that we might apply to to those projects as we move along um I mean I you know I don't know if Andy or Lisa or Fiona want to add anything but I I would say generally speaking I don't I haven't seen any results yet that indicate that you know our analyses were were far off um we're generally within the envelope of the types of uh impacts that that we would anticipate seeing i will caveat that you know on the atlantic which is still early early days those pilot projects are not commercial scale but um but i i you know we we do have um you know it we do have a lot of data to draw from to inform our environmental analyses and you know where to direct our uh, you know attention for research. But I don't know if my fellow panelists want to add any other perspective on that. I guess I can speak a little bit from the fishing industry perspective. I'm not a, a fisherman um, or fisher. Uh, I'm there, um, I work for a fishing association, uh, and there, there is a lot of concern over how 
fast development. Um, I know the um, the process has extended longer than maybe recent memory for a lot of uh, folks being involved in the process on the East Coast, uh, but there is concern that um, there's still so much uncertainty in terms of you know, potential direct impacts to their fisheries. Um, and that might be a slightly different filter than, you know, the research lens of um, what do we need to learn about, you know, impacts to herring, you know, from from noise or, or light and, and whatnot. Um, but I would just to reiterate, I think there, the concern centers around the level of uncertainty, environmental impacts, also impacts to our management processes, um, particularly uh, Andy and Lisa have, um, and Brian too, I think have already mentioned the um, impacts to uh, regional surveys. Those form the basis for a lot of our stock assessments. And at least in the, the Northeast, I'm only familiar with um, that management system having formerly worked for the New England Council higher uncertainty in your stock assessments just results in reduced quota. So I, I think um, from the, the industry's perspective, there's the impacts are still yet to come when there is commercial scale build out. Um, and that's a lot of uncertainty. And I suspect a lot of them are having trouble sleeping um, given that um, unknown for them. Um, and perhaps, maybe a good uh, future meeting topic to discuss would be the research project in the Gulf of Maine. Um, State of Maine has done a lot of work and apologies if this has already been covered in one of your um, previous meetings. Um, the State of Maine has put a lot of effort into their offshore wind roadmap and they're currently designing uh, a floating research array, which I would have to uh, ask Brian where the timeline for the research array, array um, is versus the commercial uh, leasing process uh, in that region too. But that might be um, an interesting topic if, if the committee was interested in learning about that one. Great, thank you. If, if okay, just to add a comment to that, sure. Fiona. Um, I believe that one of the consultants that is helping the state of Maine is uh, the 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 ORE catapult group or blue, the carbon trust from the UK? I think it's carbon trust. Um, so there's just for the for the committee's benefit, um, if we were able to request some sort of presentation or topic on the main research array and the state of Maine's activities, um, which we also expect will be floating wind focused as well, uh, we we might be able to also pull in some of the experiences and um, lessons learned from the Europe, from, from the North Sea in Europe. So just as a, as a two for one. Great, thank you, Dan. So it is time for our break. And so I just wanna thank uh, Fiona, Elizabeth, Andy, and Brian again. Um, and Caroline, if I'm right, we'll come back in 10 minutes. Yes. 240, 2.45. Yes, 2.45 today. Thank you again, panelists. This has been um, very informative and appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, good afternoon again, everyone. Um, we are back for the last portion of the meeting today. The All right, um, so this next session um, will be a, another panel discussion on the, from the Special Initiative on Offshore Winds Fisheries Mitigation Plan. Um, and we will hear from Chris Olaf, the director of SIOW, Lisa Engler, the deputy managing director of Offshore Wind at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, and Morgan Brunbauer, the Marine Fisheries Manager, Offshore Wind um, at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. And I see Morgan. Um, I believe Chris should be joining us shortly and we'll be sharing her slides. 
Hi, Caroline. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Wonderful. How are you? I'm good. How are you? All uh, right. And you um are going to be sharing your screen or do you want us to share the slides? No, I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Then I will turn it over to you. Great. Well, thanks all for joining. And um, just uh, to, to give a quick uh, intro on the topic we're covering and a little bit of housekeeping over the next hour or so, um, I'll be presenting the following dozen or so slides. Um, and again, my name is Chris Olith. I'm the director of the Special Initiative on Offshore Wind. And I'll talk a little bit about my role and, and my entity and, and how we're supporting the state's work on this program uh, in a moment. Um, so I'll go over the slides and then we'll have some time for discussion and question and answers. I know uh, from knowing some of you personally on this group uh, that is a really engaged and, uh, and thoughtful audience. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. As Caroline mentioned, we have Lisa and Morgan on the line who are representative from the states who are actually you know, leading the development of this program. So um, they'll be here to add some color to uh, some of the slides hopefully and uh, break things up and then also answer some questions uh, that folks may have and engage in the, the thoughtful discussion that will follow. So I'll just take about 15 or 20 minutes to go through these slides now and, and thanks all for, for joining and for your interest in this topic. Uh, the topic, as seen on the slide, is establishing a fisheries fund um, essentially at a regional level. This is what the uh, the 11 states that are involved in this program are interested in doing a fisheries compensation fund. Um, as background, the special initiative on offshore wind, along with our partners at the Consensus Building Institute, have been recruited to convene and facilitate 11 states on the East Coast as a peer network. Uh, it was now nearly three years ago that uh, a select group of states on the East Coast reached out and said, you know, we would really um, appreciate the opportunity to be convened as a peer network in a conversation on potentially establishing a regional compensatory fund for impacts from offshore wind to commercial and recreational for higher fishing. On the screen in front of you, you'll see the 11 states that are involved in the effort. And essentially, it's all the states from Maine down south to North Carolina on the East Coast. The origin story of this group is that it was back in June of 2021 when nine of these 11 states, and that was everyone except Delaware and North Carolina, sent a letter to the Biden administration encouraging them to think about ways to uh, use BOEM and, and other federal uh, partners and agencies to think about regional impacts and regional compensation with respect to offshore wind. And uh, I think it was, you know, a few of the states who kind of then behind the scenes started calling each other after their governor sent this letter and said, hey, are you guys thinking about fisheries compensation? Because we're thinking about fisheries compensation and thinking about ways we can do this in a joint way. Um, so it was then that the states started coming together again, uh, you know, that's been the role of SIOW, the Special Initiative on Offshore Wind, and our partners at the Consensus Building Institute, in order for the states to work together on this important topic. So it is, in fact, a program that the states are advancing, and SIOW is here to provide some of the support as well as uh, CBI. The 11 states have had... Um, advice and consent, you know, some, you know, uh, certainly some um, consultations with a lowercase c with uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, with NOAA and folks in the uh, offshore wind sector um, through, through a group called the American for Clean Power or ACP. Um, in addition, I would say kind of the, the most robust um, interactions that the states have had have been with the fishing community. Uh, and that's something that you'll hear, I think, as a thread throughout this presentation are ways in which the fishing community has been involved in, um, you know, the design and development of the program to date. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, kind of where we are, which, you know, I think the the states would say is still, you know, um, a, you know, kind of still early days, even though it's been a few years, it, you know, when you have 11 states working together, it can take time to shape programs. And that thoughtful deliberation has allowed space for stakeholders to provide inputs um, and also really for no firm decisions on a program to be made yet. 
Uh, so I think that's important to understand the status. So, you know, many folks ask questions about, well, you know, what can actually be compensated in this type of program and who's eligible and really specific questions? Well, I guess it's, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it takes a long time to get to those answers, but the good news is that, you know, these questions have not already, the answers have not been predetermined. The states have not, you know, figured out the answers without, uh, you know, the fishing community at the table. So um, I'm excited to share, you know, some of the progress that has been made on the project as we go through the presentation today. Um, but really, uh, the, the 11 states with their intent to establish this fund um, would be for all the fishing community members on the East Coast, and that's both upstream and downstream members of the fishing community, not just fishermen, um, and really from all states on the East Coast, regardless of where the fisheries are porting from or where they are landing. So it's every East Coast state, even though you see only 11 listed here on the screen. I think it's, you know, really amazing the work the states have done over the past few years, recognizing that not all states have the same type of jurisdiction when it comes to the Coastal Zone Management Act and other state authorities relating to offshore wind, and really wanting to, I think, support other states in having as much potential reach and impact and contribution to the fishing community as possible, uh, even if they don't have the same level of reach in some of those ways. The state's objective in all this is really to establish a credible regional administrator for managing and distributing fisheries compensation funds for offshore wind and on the eastern U.S. seaboard. Um, and I think something the states have been very clear about stating from very early on is that mitigation is only to be used once avoidance and minimizing options have been exhausted. So thinking about that critical NEPA hierarchy where first avoiding is happening and that's what the folks, you know, I think at the federal agencies are doing when they're working on siting and those important high level issues. Um, so that's avoiding, minimizing, that's happening at various stages through offshore wind development proposals, including when the developers are, uh, you know, siting turbines or how their layouts work um, and other factors in developing their wind farms. There is then, of course, the opportunity to mitigate, uh, you know, before financial mitigation even. And so there's a variety of, you know, uh, you know, resiliency programs, adaptation programs and things with essentially the final step in that hierarchy looking like individual financial compensation for harm and losses from offshore wind. And that is the program that the states have been most focused on uh, setting up. This would be in contrast to what the states have seen so far, which are individual compensation programs. Individual compensation programs currently exist for the South Fork Offshore Wind Project and the Vineyard Wind One Offshore Wind Project. Those programs are launched, um, and I'm not as intimately familiar with the details of those. Uh, I'm sure Lisa from the Math Clean Energy Center could provide you with more details on those in the Q&A portion. But broadly speaking, those programs um, are designed for the developer to take the funds that have been, uh, you know, indicated through their permitting process and, and permit requirements saying, you know, you have X amount of harm for, you know, potentially to the fishing community, you must put X dollars aside based on that harm. And I'm kind of speaking in, in broad generalities here, but due to that harm, you must establish a fund for compensation. Um, but in these cases, the developers are standing those funds up along with the, you know, you know, conversations and, and consultations with the agencies and fishermen, and then managing those funds typically, you know, kind of in, you know, in some cases, handing them off to the state or managing them on their own. So um, that is essentially how the states, how the you know programs are being run for fishery compensation now on a project by project basis. So an offshore wind developer builds a project and they administer, you know, and, and contribute to a compensation fund. The difference here is that the compensation fund would be regional. So when the developer is uh, required to put funds into uh, a compensation program, that would go into a, you know, a pool that was managed by a third party. And regardless of, uh, you know, 
where you know the fisherman was ported or where they were landing, they could apply for compensation from those funds. And again, you know, all these, uh, you know, this is still very pre-decisional, but the concept is would be able to apply on a regional basis as opposed on a project by project basis. And you might imagine there are uh, extreme efficiencies associated with streamlining to one fund, not needing to learn different application timelines and processes. Um, and other administrative uh, minutia, as well as reducing cost, because each one of these state specific funds are very expensive to establish and require a lot of time and energy and, you know, stakeholder engagement with the fishing community who have a lot of stakeholder fatigue around offshore wind. So the extent to which we can reduce the fatigue for the fishing stakeholders and maximize uh, the funds that are available for compensation, I think this, you know, that's part of the state's goals. Uh, the full objectives are listed on the screen in front of you, which is essentially to develop a consistency across projects and developers for compensation funds, to um, really highlight fairness for the fisheries, regardless of their port of origin or port of landing. Looking for an administrator with processes and procedures that you know, fishermen can have a one-stop shop regardless of where they're fishing or, or landing. The states want to build a, uh, a program that has a large enough scale to really see expertise and efficiencies benefiting stakeholders um, and to have a program that avoids duplication and ensures that the most funds are available for the impacted communities. The value proposition, which I think we've stated already, but just to kind of put the fine point on it, is the idea to provide a regional fund administrator to provide fisheries an accessible, equitable, and consistent one-stop shop for filing and receiving claims for individual costs and losses imposed on fishing enterprises by one or more offshore wind projects. Drink of water. I don't really know how folks are like professors and talk for two hours. I just don't understand it. Plus, I have to tell you, I was screaming. I went to Ohio yesterday to watch the eclipse and I was screaming my head off. So it was so fun. I hope you all got to check it out. Okay, on to the next portion. Um, so the idea the states came up with is, okay, we're going to hire a third party to manage a regional fund. And so a scoping process ensued where... Um, the idea was to have, you know, robust participation from the fishing community and the offshore wind developers to get a sense of what the scope and work and, you know, um, eligibility and important criteria would be for a potential fund administrator, recognizing the states would not administer the fund, but it would be a third party. Really, the focus of this uh, third party who would manage the fund, as the states have uh, deemed, is that they would manage the money uh, once it was deposited uh, into a compensation program, and then also kind of manage the money as it, as it flowed out to the fishing community. In terms of the money in, that isn't something the states have been focused on because it's something that would otherwise be determined by outside forces and that whether that's through, uh, you know, the NEPA analysis and what's determined to be uh, required by developers, if it was through lease credits or bid credits that, uh, that offshore wind developers were also paying and funds being diverted uh, into a, comp a compensation fund such as this. Certainly, um, Brian Hooker, who I believe had been on the line or may still be on, can speak to Bohm's compensatory mitigation guidance, which is still in draft form, but I think really has a lot of great, um, you know, inputs from the fishing community and others on the priorities for a compensation program. So again, really the role of the fund administrator in the state's mind was to manage the money that, that was in the fund and then uh, hold that money and then distribute those funds. And you can see here a further breakdown of the primary tasks of the potential fund administrator. The first step being to design and develop a claims program, share that program, socialize that, finalize that, uh, accept and review claims, verify those claims, and then potentially you know, par paying those out. And we've talked to groups like the ASMFC potentially to be 
uh, the operational side of actually processing uh, compensation to the fishing community. Uh, again, we're still in the uh, deliberation stages of figuring out how exactly all that might work. Listed here are the key qualities of a fund administrator that were uh, decided by a, a kind of a multi-sectoral stakeholder group that included the fishing community, the states, and the offshore wind developers um, as the RFP to solicit bids for a potential regional fund administrator were developed. So there was a participatory process across all three sectors and uh, based on the input from those groups and based on you know, their thoughts on governance and steps forward, uh, the bullets you see listed here, including strong fiduciary control, a legitimate group in the eyes of stakeholders, uh, a group that's free of bias and, and free of conflict, a group who has demonstrated competency in reviewing claims previously, uh, you know, prevents waste and fraud, has fisheries experience, et cetera. You can see those key qualities of a fund administrator listed here on the slide. Uh, the In terms of where the process has gone to date, NYSERDA, which is the New York entity who has been most, uh, I would say, deeply engaged in uh, setting up this compensation fund in terms of the New York agencies, um, they have agreed to serve as the procurement agent on behalf of the 11 states, and they, um, on behalf of the 11 states, released a request for proposals earlier this year, <clears throat> excuse me, which closed a uh, about a month ago or so, just about a few weeks ago now, I guess. Um, and uh, those, uh, you know, bids came in based on that RFP that was developed jointly. Um, the states... Uh, the offshore wind developers and uh, the, the and some fishermen were involved in the development of the RFI that informed the RFP, um, and it is a joint committee of the three sectors, so states, developers, and fishermen, who will select a winning bidder if uh, one rises to the top as part of the scoring committee process. In order to design and development to develop the program which is the phase that, uh, you know, the RF, the RFA, the regional fund administrator would be walking into from based on this RFP. <laughs> there was more than $2 million needed to be raised. And um, as part of that states raised money, the offshore wind develop uh, offshore wind developers or ACP members as listed here, uh, raised money and we raised money through uh, foundation and, and grant proposals to create a fund in order to design the fund. Because in order to uh, design and develop the program, we determined over $2 million was needed. And uh, since the fund doesn't yet exist and will you know, kind of continue to be seeded by developer deposits once it's established, it was this multi-sectoral group that uh, you know, established the initial funding. In terms of the design and development phase, uh, which you'll see is kind of like the third step that's listed here on the slide. So the first step was through that RFI where early feedback was received by the sectors to the states. Um, the procurement phase, which is kind of in development now with the bids currently being reviewed by the uh, three sectors. What uh, we'll talk about now is the design and development phase and the role of what's known as the Design Oversight Committee or the DOC, which will be working alongside with the Regional Fund Administrator to, uh, you know, I think have an important role in terms of um, uh, really collecting broad engagement from the fishing community, working through uh, ad hoc workshops, interviews and meetings, and then kind of feeding information into that Design Oversight Committee to help inform the regional fund administrator. The design oversight committee will be comprised of three state representatives, three offshore wind developers, and six members of the fishing community. Each one of these caucuses are self-selecting and that process is underway currently. Each one of them have, you know, kind of, I think their own, you know, unique uh, ways of thinking about who should be nominated for the design oversight committee. Um, in addition, the states plan on including uh, NIMS, the ASMFC, 
BOEM and the Fisheries Management Councils as potential ex officio members of that design oversight committee. Um, and then also have kind of a, a liaison in process for other states and other actively engaged members. So the DOC or Design Oversight Committee is in formation currently. The charter is currently in development. So this, again, kind of earlier days in uh, developing this body. And we look forward to discussing that with you and getting the feedback. Those are my dogs. Okay, I'll mute you for one second. I think one issue that we would, uh, you know, want to highlight that has been, um, you know, something that the states have acknowledged and something that is important for the uh, the RFA or the regional fund administrator once selected to address is the incorporation and inclusion of the recreational for hire fishing community. Because based on the data, recreational fishing is likely to have 10% or less of total estimated lost revenues and costs. And any commensurate representation would cause them to be outvoted, essentially, the way the design oversight committee has been envisioned. Um, we really, uh, the states are, that is looking for the, the regional fund administrator to propose how the recreational community could be best engaged here. And we would love uh, if there are thoughts from this group to hear from that as well. Um, the Again, the RFP proposers for the regional fund administrator must appro uh, propose an approach on this. And otherwise, again, those three caucuses are each selecting their own members for the design oversight committee. The key uh, elements for the design oversight committee to advise on to the RFA are who is eligible for compensation, how evidence of impacts and burden of proof may be determined, what is compensable, what are the multipliers for processors and others, uh, what are the data sources and verification needed, um, you know, and other, you know, there's an innumerable amount of details to be worked out through the design and development of this program. So the Design Oversight Committee will be a key uh, partner in supporting that. Some of the tasks and authorities of this Design Oversight Committee are to approve key processes proposed by the RFP. So they, the Design Oversight Committee would be reviewing the work plan, scope, and stakeholder engagement plans. Um, they would advise on some of the key elements of the claims process uh, as listed here, and then also have the opportunity to review the performance of the regional fund administrator. Important to note that the scope of the regional fund administrator based on the RFP that NYSERDA released is just for the design and development phase of the program. They would be eligible based on performance to participate in the program going forward, being the, the claims administrator for the program for the first, uh, you know, the first term. However, um, the DOC will have kind of a role in, in also reviewing their work and making sure that they've met expectations to date to see if they would be appropriate. The regional fund administrator uh, will need to propose a stakeholder engagement plan as part of their RFP. Um, and so those were being reviewed now. The information that was included in the RFP is listed here on the slide in terms of, you know, what their engagement in process and substance are and what they would recommend stakeholders bring to the DOC for advice and how those are incorporated uh, through comment periods and such. The last slide is just to uh, give folks a reminder uh, on what our timeline has been to date for the states and how that is moving forward. Uh, we originally, again, started supporting the nine states um, back in June of 2021, shortly after they sent that letter to President Biden. The group grew to 11 states last year. They've been meeting, you know, and incorporating and including developers and the fishing community in their deliberations. The big milestone was really in February of launching the RFP for the regional fund administrator. Um, and the next big timeline uh, milestone would be contracting the potential RFA uh, in the summer of this year. So exciting developments coming up on this program, real, I think, uh, you know, tangible milestones. And, uh, you know, just congratulations to the states for all of their good work on this. And, you know, thanks to the federal partners and others on the line who have been providing so much thought and guidance um, as the states have worked through this program. So. 
I think we have some time to kind of open the floor for some questions and uh, would love for Lisa and Morgan to also kind of join in at this point and uh, hear from folks on the line. Great, thank you. Lisa or Morgan, do you want to add anything before we open up for questions? No, I, I think that's that's a good overview. And I think we just want to, again, get to the this discussion and questions part and happy to answer whatever we can during the, the time we have. Lisa, that sound good? Great. All right. Uh, committee members, I'm trying to change my view so I can see everybody. Ron, I see your hands up. Hi, Lisa knows my views on this. <laughs> uh, I think this is, <clears throat> for the last 10 years, not the way to go compensating individual fishermen. So let me just put one thing on a table. So if this program is similar to what's developed in Massachusetts with uh, Vineyard Wind or South Fork, it's about losses in the footprint of the wind energy areas. And the fishermen would have to document that and, and, and show an economic loss and get compensated for that. But how does society get compensated for the lost seafood that's not landed? Okay, are we going to just start importing more from China? Is that the plan? I mean, that's just sort of question one. Um, is that just economically compensating a fisherman for a percentage of his losses from the wood footprint? That's, that's catch that doesn't cross the dock. And that has a lot of economic impacts, but it's also local seafood and the whole issue of food security. I'm just wondering, is that brought up in your discussions? I'll just jump in first to say that, um, Ron, thanks for, for your thoughts and feedback. Um, that the focus of this program is on fisheries compensation to, you know, help address financial harm to the fishing community. I think there are a whole host of potential impacts from offshore wind that are, you know, may, may or may not be appropriate to be addressed through a program of this, you know, of this type. But um, that certainly would be something that maybe in a, a parallel program or, you know, another, uh, you know, another approach, but I think the, the focus to date has been, like you said, not that, but rather financial impacts to fishermen, not saying that the other impacts aren't important, but I also think it's important because of the hypersensitivity around financial compensation that there has been in the community for many years, that this program stay hyper-focused and, and uh, really kind of drill down on issues related to compensation, not that the other ones are not important. I don't think that means that they're not important. It's just, how do you try to address all things? If you try to address all things with one compensation program, I feel like it would just could be too diluted and distracted um, from the original intent. Uh, thank you for your answer. I, <clears throat> I have other comments, but let me let other people speak first. Thank you. Yeah, I would, Ron, if I could just respond quickly to, hi, Ron, nice to see you. Um, nice to see everybody. Thanks for having us. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold. Um, <clears throat> I think we are still in the learning phases of offshore wind development. I think we can all acknowledge that. I think that's why this committee exists, right? Um, and that's why we're all here today. And I think, Ron, Related to that, we don't know exactly how the industry as a whole and how our seafood diet as a society will be affected yet. I think it's something that we need to be aware of and we need to probably be thinking about how do we provide funds to understand those potential impacts 
But at this point, you know, we're, we're tackling the thing that we know more about, not, and I'm not even saying we know all about the direct impacts to the fishing industry specifically, because we don't know that either. But I think at, at this point in the process and at this point in the development, we need, we're working towards uh, understanding what we know from what we don't know, and then um, trying to understand how do we um, mitigate the impacts that we're aware of and that we can put our arms around. I think it's a really good point and something we need to be aware of as we move forward, though. <clears throat> yeah, and just, again, thanks for raising that. I think that, Ron, when we've spoken before, that has definitely come up. And again, that's not to say that this program is the catch-all, end-all, be-all, but we have a, a, you know, what I'll say is a problem in front of us, right? That might be out of order of that mitigation hierarchy of avoidance, minimizing and mitigating. Um, and the differences in the approaches that, you know, Vineyard has taken in, in South Fork, or I believe that's Orsted has taken, you know, there's inconsistencies between the programs. There's, you know, it's a little confusing for the, the industry to understand, you know, who, who is eligible and who is not and how to apply. And I think, what we as states are trying to do is bring some uh, efficiencies, some equities, and some consistency, as well as transparency in the process, right? Um, and that's not to say that um, this is the only thing we should be working on together as states, but this is just a problem that's in front of us that is moving on maybe at a different timeline than some of the other components, and we're trying to triage this as best we, <clears throat> as best we can. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. I, I think Morgan uh, appreciated, uh, you know, I think Morgan really hit on what I was trying to say is that, yeah, this is focusing on just one piece of that whole mitigation hierarchy. And we're definitely, I, I'm speaking from, you know, Boehm's perspective on, on this is that, you know, we're not saying, oh, let's give up on the other things and let's just focus on compensation. All the other, you know, all the other mitigations that, um, you know, are available, you know, from its, the, the initial siting to uh, design and, and other aspects, um, I think have, you know, just as much importance, if not more, based on what you were just saying, Ryan, of trying to avoid those those impacts so we're not, you know, seeing those effects that, that you, you, uh, you were hypothetical. Uh, you uh, suggested. So, thanks. Dan? Am I mute? Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thanks. Nice seeing you, Chris. I'm glad you, you were able to make it here. Good presentation. Um, in my mind, and I agree a lot with, uh, with what Ron has said and we've talked a lot about it in the past, especially when we met in Washington. Um, but I have lots of other uh, questions about this. This is only one, in my mind, only one side or one piece of this whole puzzle when it comes to compensation. We know there's going to be unintended consequences. We know some of it might actually be intended and have to be done if we're gonna build this stuff as fast as we're gonna build it. And um, I, I think the onus to pay for this shouldn't necessarily be the states. It should be the companies that are building it and that they're gonna make the money off it and they make their money by charging clients for the electricity. So bottom line is, is that everyone who uses clean energy to save our oceans, our world, et cetera, et cetera, because we've got to clean this up, um, is going to end up paying for it. Then if you take that money and it's not just compensation where you got to pay for your lost bottom or your lost catch or the processor not getting as much fish or the consumer not getting local fish to eat, um, you need to look at other things, too, that you would use that money for, like creating jobs for the people that will be getting put out of jobs, commercial fishermen, um, charter operators uh, for recreational anglers, um, re-educating these people to put them to work where they know they're going to be, where they're already being displaced from where the wind farms are going to be. You might as well put them to work in the farms, teach them how to work on it, use their vessels. So the vessels don't get scrapped when they can't use them anymore. And that needs to be paid for. 
And to me, that's as important, if not more so, than actually doing a regional fund um, to split money up amongst people who have to somehow prove what they're losing, <laughs> which is not going to be an easy thing in a fishing business, having been in that business as a commercial fisherman myself. And I think Ron can, can tell you, um, you know, if you're saying, well, I used to catch them in this spot. And I don't catch them here anymore because we've got a wind farm. However, the oceans are changing and currents are changing and temperatures are changing and there's all kinds of environmental changes going on as well. It's going to be hard to prove that stuff. And I see lots of issues with this. I think we need to engage the commercial and for charter business, um, but especially the commercial fishing business in in plans that will give them a way to make a living. These guys don't just want to get paid and then go drive a truck somewhere. They love the water. They love their boats. They love what they're doing. And I wouldn't think uh, that you want to send them away, put them out to pasture. That, that's my thoughts on it. And I see this, Chris, as being just one small piece and maybe not the most important piece of this. My thoughts. Thank yeah, thanks, Dan. Really, really appreciate it. Just a couple of uh, clarifications and apologies if it wasn't clear in the presentation. The developers are the ones who are paying for this. Uh, the states are kind of putting together a program to create a framework, um, and that framework will be have uptake by a third party. And really, I think the states are envisioning this kind of opening up to have broader ownership by the fishing community, developers, and the states as a multi-sectoral program. So the developers through the NEPA analysis and how much, and I don't know if Brian wants to chime in at all, but essentially what is determined through the potential socioeconomic impacts through the NEPA analysis, which I'm not an expert on, but uh, through that and, and other mechanisms, the developers will be seeding the fund exclusively. Um, and, I, and I agree with you as well that there are a lot of other components of you know, issues around fairness and proof that will be really challenging that I think the other programs have seen with South Fork and Orsted already. So okay, I just might follow up with that quickly. Yeah. Okay. I don't think the developers are going to pay enough money and they're, and it be, behooves them to pay as little as possible. That's what a good businessman would do. Okay. But it's up to us to make sure, and that's the industry itself to make sure they're really going to uh, pay enough money to compensate in a realistic fashion, um, what is needed. And that, that's what I'm concerned about. And that's one of the main reasons that I, I sit on this committee is so that I can watch this process happen and open my mouth when I need to. Thanks. Yeah. yeah and, that. And, and thank you, Dan. Um, you know, I think, again, this is just a small sliver of the different uh, needs that have to be addressed, right? You raise jobs, you raised, you know, what happens to the vessels? Like, can they be involved in research? How, I think that's, that's a whole other you know, I think conversation for an, for another day that that we can come back and I think talk to this group about. Um, this was just for this small sliver, um, and as Chris mentioned, this is part of the NEPA process. So while this um, is part and is is part of that rod of record of decision, notice of intent about what this this money is for. That doesn't mean that that's where this stops or that's where this should begin. All of those other pieces that you raised need to happen. Those conversations are happening. Um, you know, the how do you involve the fishing industry so you're not transitioning them out of fishing, but how do you enhance fisheries? All of those conversations are also happening too at the same time. This is just one small sliver of, of what's in front of us as states. <clears throat> to try and work together to, to advance this. And I'll, I'll pass it off to Lisa. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, Dan, for your, for your comments. Um, <clears throat> first, I, um, you know, as Morgan said, right now, the way that these, the, the mitigation has been um, developed is through the NEPA process at BOEM. Um, and that has a defined timeline and through the, the state's federal consistency review process. So. Um, and that has a defined timeline and, and then an end with a product that states the mitigation. Um, and that's just what we have right now to, to frame out the mitigation um, required um, for, for the fishing industry and potential impacts. Um, there have been discussions about how to reopen mitigation 
agreed to through this process, but um, there and Rhode Island began to think about that in terms of um, in the framework of their state process, you know, if impacts were different than what was originally um, in, uh, proposed, then there might be a way for um, to require the developer to come back. Um, but right now, that's not something that's available to other states. Um, and Brian can probably speak better than I to the NEPA process. But, you know, uh, relating to uncertainty, you know, this is an area that we're not sure about. You know, what were the assessments of mitigation right now are based on the information we have available to us. It's quite possible that something's different in the future. And so we do need to think about what happens if that occurs. Um, and agree that is something that we need to spend some some good group think time on. The other thing I wanted to point out is that um, your point about bringing fishermen along and providing opportunities to continue to work on the water if they're not able to fish as much as they want or would like or just choose not to anymore within this offshore wind space. Um, the developers that we've been working with have been doing a lot to train fishermen um, to help a survey, to help as, um, I forget what they're called, but they're basically like safety vessels that are out during construction to help um, keep other fishermen away and keep the line, the corridors clear um, and the safety zone intact when construction is going on. So there are efforts by the developers to teach um, fishermen new skills to, to work within the, the offshore space. Related to that, some of the projects and some of the compensatory mitigation plans have included the opportunity for fishermen to take the advantage of upgrading their navigation and safety gear on their vessels. And so that I also see as something that not only, you know, helps um, with, you know, their just general day-to-day -day fishing operations, um, but it also helps with fishing within the array potentially as well and any other activities that they might take on um, on that vessel. So I think that's an example of sort of helping lift up the fishing industry as a whole. And again, that's a cost that is borne by the developers um, as well. So certainly more that we can do and more that we can ask, but those are a couple examples of activities that developers are doing currently, at least in the Massachusetts space. Great, thanks, Dan. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. That um, and hi, Chris. Uh, great to see this presentation, see this progress. Um, Lisa, you you mentioned I want to I want to focus in on a comment you made about how we really don't know the impacts. Um, so, what are we mitigating? What are we truly mitigating uh, through these this this type of funding mechanism? And maybe this is another topic, uh, Brian or Andy, if he's still on the call, you know, have we, and, and, and this was a thought inspired by Ron's comment about the potential for the stock to be affected and, and less seafood or potentially less seafood coming over, coming over the, the docks of landing, thus impacting our protein supply. Um, do we know if all of the impacts, so here's my question. Do we know that fishermen will truly be excluded from fishing within the wind farms? Um, I, I've, heard, I've heard varying responses to that. Uh, some say that the insurance, the vessel insurers won't allow them to fish inside. Um, I've heard that maybe they will fish inside. But if there is a reduction of fishing pressure um, and fishing mortality on these areas, you know, are we not potentially getting a positive impact of having increased fecundity, having increased refugia, having increased habitat structure, et cetera? Um, I, I recall when I first got started in this business in the late 90s with the closed scallop area science and studies, uh, no, you know, nymphs heard that there were tons of, of scallops that were harvestable inside the closed area. And we went in and we found them. And the rotational closed area approach has been a pretty resounding success with a few economic challenges and structuring of the fleet and that, that aside. But from a biological perspective, there are, there are healthier scallop stocks today 
because of some closed areas. And maybe there is a opportunity here that these wind farms, as they grow, as they become more extensive across the continental shelf, there might be some positive benefits as well. I just, I'd, I'd love to hear some thoughts on that or some studies or is that even being considered? Is that feasible as, 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 an, as a positive impact? And then the, the scientist in me is like, so what would happen to mitigation funding if there's a positive impact? <laughs> so, yeah. so, total aside. <laughs> Dan, it's a, a very, very interesting discussion point. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sorry if I, my comment about we don't know the impacts um, came across as glib or, you know, just in passing, comment in passing, but I, I really probably should have been more clear and said we don't know the extent of impacts. Uh, and we don't know if they're positive or negative too, or where there will be positive or negative impacts. And I, I have recently tried to steer away from using the word impact and using the word effect, um, because I think that uh, allows for more conversation around positive or negative um, as well. So um, I just wanna note that and you know say that, although I said we don't know, I would say that we don't know with certainty um, I think we are getting more information on, about potential effects. Um, and for sure, we will know soon about potential effects as these projects get up and running. And I think it's very important that we figure out how to monitor the actual fishing activity within and around these projects as they get up and running. And I think it's really important that we provide that funding is provided, I don't know from whom, but funding is provided to understand um, that fishing activity. Um, the exclusion, uh, you know, and I, I could just talk probably all day about this, but, you know, I think my opinion is that there will be exclusion for a short period of time as behavior changes, there's adaptation of gear, of um, navigation systems, right? And then there will probably be a reintroduction of um, fishing boats. It might not be all, it might just be some sectors. It might be not, you know, it might be the younger generation. I don't know. Um, but I do think that there will be fishing within these spaces in the future. Um, but we'll see, and we need to be able to monitor that and understand it and then build it into these mitigation plans as we think about them for the future projects. When we had conversations with the developers that have uh, codified mitigation plans, they made a lot of assumptions about that behavior change within these arrays. And, you know, they got the best scientists on the, you know, around to be involved in that conversation. They got Woods Hole and others to think about that. And they made a lot of assumptions. I think that they were fair assumptions, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll need to see if that, the effects to fishing activity and then also um, fish availability um, are actually true um, and match the assumptions and, and then we'll build that into the future cases. So I think we know some, um, do we know everything? No, is there a lot of uncertainty? Yes, and I think the question is how do we reduce that uncertainty as we move the industries forward? Yeah, and, and then just to add to that, you know, again, slightly outside of the scope of, of this effort here, you know, we are, are looking at, at avenues for stock enhancement. Um, and what does that mean? We are working with here in New York, working with the surf clam industry on a, a stock enhancement project to try and address some of their, their questions around, is this possible? How, how do they grow? All of those things as, um, you know, more of a, quote unquote, resiliency, right? Like if we are to, to build these projects smarter and, and more environmentally sound and to rise, you know, and, and increase, you know, the potential for the industry, are there projects or opportunities that we can work on together? So that's an example of like stock enhancement, you know, or as, as Lisa raised, you know, as vessels begin to come back into the, the areas after construction, do we need to have a conversation about fisheries management and gear advancement that could promote quote unquote coexistence? You know, those are not easy conversations to have. There are costs associated with, with change out. Is it even possible? What are the fisheries management implications, you know? But if we are going to wait until after 
wind farms are built to have those conversations, we're losing the valuable time to to think about what what are those management implications? You know, what is the data that needs to be collected? What are the design implications? Like all of those things need to ha happen, right? But that doesn't mean we focus on fisheries compensation and then focus on that. We also have to focus on those other things. So those are all happening at the same time. Um, and again, the, the fishability aspect of it, you know, we, we work, Lisa and I probably work with the same fishing individual who says, I tell you, you can't go fishing in there. The developers say you can, no one's going to know until these things are built. Right. So I, I think there's a little bit of truth to that, you know, and, and some gears may or may not be able to. And again, we're, we're, I'll just caveat this. We're talking about fixed. Once you talk about floating, there's a whole other set of assumptions and considerations that have to be worked on um, layout technology choices, anchoring that that's a whole other conversation probably for a different day, but you know, different considerations there. I know we have another question, so I won't, I won't drag on. Janet. Hi, thanks for this. Let me lower my hand. I my my question is kind of for Chris around her her money in box that she had, and thinking a little bit, just questioning a little bit about sort of what the thought process was and the thinking behind this. So one question that I I've been kind of wrestling with is how do you how do you sort of incentivize support for this? And one way to do that is to maybe potentially model compensation after the Alaska Permanent Fund which is uh, basically uh, a process by which compensation is, is given in the form of uh, a fund generated from revenue from um, offshore mining and drilling in Alaska. And that's a way, you know, we talk about it in terms of compensation. So, so compensating fishermen for a lost opportunity. But if but there is a potential for kind of reframing the conversation for revenue generating in in a you know new um, uh, new blue energy economy, and and the Alaska PD fund is is sort of one example of how revenue can be used as a kind of incentivizing um, approach. And I'm just curious as we talk about setting up these compensation funds. What has been the conversation around kind of driving some of that money in from revenue generated from offshore wind companies that is then given as a form of payout to consumers? Uh, yeah, great question, Janet. And thanks for making us aware of the Alaska Permanent Fund. I wasn't aware of that and certainly be doing some, some homework. Um, but essentially, the, the compensation and, and the funds that are moving in to this program are ones that are re already required through the permitting process. I'm not saying that they couldn't be supplemented in other ways, but essentially funds that were already required to be paid out for compensation by developers. And really what the efforts of the 11 states are is to create a fund that can more efficiently and more fairly distribute the funds that the developers are already paying for compensation. And it's kind of earmarked as such through the NEPA process. I'm feel free to chime in at any point, Brian, or not, because you already chime in all the time. But feel free to chime in on, you know, developers are submitting required compensation plans, uh, you know, plans that are required by BOEM to say, how will you compensate? How will you, you know, essentially comply with the NEPA hierarchy, not just how will you compensate, but how will you do all the things? Um, and one of the things they need to do based on that, the permit conditions is, you know, take that sum of money and put it somewhere. And so what the states are doing is saying, hey, that somewhere could be done a lot more efficiently and a lot more fairly and a lot more transparently. Um, you know, if, if there are ways to supplement that money in, uh, and again, this is why the states really haven't put, and you know, I, I'm not the one developing the program. I'm just, you know, kind of the one helping facilitate it. And so what the states have said is, you know, that, that money in is kind of already happening. Like it's already in process. How do we redirect it in a way that's most equitable? Right. And I think what is often lost here, too, is that where the money goes question is left up to the developer at this point. Right. So 
the developer has a little bit more control as to where it goes. Thus, you know, Massachusetts could have a different program than New York, could have a different program than Maine. However, you might have fishermen who are accessing three different leases that have, you know, six different projects that go to seven different states. And now you have all these different variables that the industry has to maneuver and really it's it's not an efficient process for anyone um i'll also say to, to bohm's credit they are considering and brian jump in here uh uh big credits as part of the the leasing process for uh fishing compensation and i know that there has been conversation about those um uh, lease fees also going to compensation or or other other things, right? So I think there's there's open comment periods in, in different forms uh, or, in, or in different areas right now on the East Coast about um, where those dollars could go, right? So I think what you're raising is a is a perfectly valid one of how do you direct that money from other other sources either to go towards compensation or could they go to other things, research, you know, tribal considerations, workforce development, you know, I think you can, you can list out a whole slew of, of different options there, but I, I do give Bohm kudos to thinking about that, right? Um, Thanks, Morgan. Well, I, 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 I would just... Oh, go ahead. I would just I would just encourage thinking a little bit about sort of this alternative source. I mean, it is a way of potentially incentivizing support, which is to to kind of have a set aside of the proceeds of the revenue generated that goes back to the states into a permanent fund that, yeah, could be used for investment in research. It could be used for compensation. Um, it it is a way I think of of kind of generating support for the industry and wanting to see the industry success if it's based on a revenue generating a model that is gen generating revenue from proceeds from offshore wind use. Yeah, and I th I think that you know there's there's potential legislation out there the Rise Act, mm -hmm. um, some in the Collaborate Act. Um, again, those are I think all options on the table. Um, but, you know, right now I think we're wor working within the, in the, the framework we have to try and move it forward, but Brian, go ahead and, and no, I was just going to say, I, I put, I just read just a second ago in the Q and a put the link to the collaborate act, uh, the discussion draft that Senator Whitehouse, mm -hmm. uh, put out, you know, just, yeah, there, Congress is thinking about this because I think that's what it would take as an act of Congress. I think Boehm is doing everything he can do within, you know, the existing regulations and authorities that it has is, but some of the things I think you're talking about are either you know, state level or would require additional legislation. Okay. Yeah, okay. And that's not to say we don't, we move forward with uh, the design and development of this program. And, and just to reiterate for everyone who's, who's on the committee, you know, yes, we've done three years worth of work, but essentially we've come together to say the regional approach is where we think we need to go. All the details still have to be worked out. Right. And, um, it, it would not be um, a good idea for the states, developers, and fishermen who are working on this and plan to work through this process if we're only focusing on the design and development. We also have to re-engage and have that conversation about money in, right? Because at the end of the day, if you design a program, it could be the best program in the world, but if you don't have an efficient way to get money in, one way or the other, you've wasted two years and you've wasted time, right? So I think that's a very valid point that this needs to happen at the same time and, and how does that all work together, right? So something to take back to the group. Okay, thanks. All right, I'm gonna take the pause from committee of uh, to sort of summarize maybe two questions from the Q&A for everyone. Uh, one's more of a sort of comment, but I'll, maybe I'll turn it into a question. So one is, when you guys are thinking about the compensation, how much of this is associated with direct impacts? Like, as Dan said, I was fishing in this area, now I can't. 
versus indirect impacts, like you change the migration pattern of right whales, it moves into more integration or interaction with lobster gear, and that lobster person then's impacted not directly from the wind farm, but because of the, the shift in the migration. And the same thing could be said here in California with Dungeness and humpback whale migrations. You know, if they get pushed inshore more, that would then impact the fleet indirectly from the, the wind farm. So maybe just discuss this idea of the direct versus these indirect effects, and maybe the indirect are not within your purview, or just maybe discuss that. Lisa, you want to jump in first, and then I'll. Um, yeah, so I, um, so direct and indirect, I think, have, have different meanings depending on which group you're talking to. In terms of how we've structured the compensation packages thus far, um, there is an indirect uh, multiplier that's added to the compensatory mitigation um, that's assessed. So the amount of displaced fishing activity, the economic value of that has a multiplier added to it to take into account the downstream impacts of that lost fishing revenue. So <clears throat> upstream and downstream in some cases. So upstream would be like ice and gas and downstream is the fish processors, right? So when you say indirect, that's automatically what I go to, but so just wanted to clarify that. <clears throat> um, the, and then there are other pieces to the compensation that uh, packages that have come about. I mean, you mentioned fishing gear. So there is compensation for damaged fishing gear associated with the projects. So loss or damaged fishing gear, you can, a fisherman can place claim for that. And that's handled by the developer separately from the state agreed plans. Um, and then more specifically to, I think what you're really getting at is, you know, these, these other potential impacts that we know could, could occur, but we, I would say we're not quite sure um, the magnitude of, of the effect there or, you know, how, you know, a project could be shaped or altered in its design um, so that those effects would be less. Um, there are, there's no direct compensation for that that I'm aware of. However, the developers have been part of the conversations relating to regional habitat um, research activities through the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative. And that entity, um, which developers are a part of and pay a fee, a membership fee essentially to be part of, um, that entity thinks about what research questions there are surrounding offshore wind and wildlife and habitat, and then seek to move those research initiatives forward. So there is, you know, it's not a direct, we know you will affect um, right whale um, migration patterns, and so you must pay this amount. It's more, you must help support the body of knowledge around this potential issue um, through things like the RWSC. Also in Massachusetts, um, there have been, their developers have provided additional funds outside of the compensatory mitigation through their procurement process to help support research, um, such as um, Vineyard's Wind and Whale Fund, for example. So I'll stop there and see if others have thoughts. I'll go, Chris. Well, I just wanna say in concept uh, quickly that it's important we've heard from the fishing community that to, when considering what things are compensable, that, uh, you know, there are a limited pool of funds available, right, through, you know, and maybe it could grow or change depending on if bid credits or operating fees are, you know, entered into the equation. But in broad strokes, you know, BOEM is looking at NOAA's economic exposure data, putting, you know, setting aside that money, and if it, and if there are too many things that are deemed compensable, then the money could run short. And so I think, you know, there's this nuance and balancing act that the fishing community is giving the state's feedback on, on exactly what's compensable and what's not to ensure that it's fair, balanced, but it also is kind of equitable across parties. So I think that's a tension I just wanted to mention. Yeah. And, and Chris, um, taking a little bit of a step back there, you know, while we've engaged with the, the fishing communities, um, it has not been, I will call, as robust as it needs to be, right? And I, I think that's part of this 
you know, hiring of a, a regional fund administrator is to help um, with that engagement, right? You know, you take you, you you speak about broad level engagement. What does that mean? You know, how do you interact with the different ports, the different geographies here? You know, how do you how do you have meetings? How do you have forums about specific topics? And then you have that that kind of design oversight committee that that Chris mentioned, which is another method to kind of provide that initial feedback to the the administrator about you know is that the right path to go down right if you're going to talk about eligibility and, and and losses or 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 direct impacts or or um reporting requirements that might be needed or how a um an application is designed right you know how do you how do you make all of that work together because ultimately here you know it, it's not and I saw a comment here in the in the Q and A about it's 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 not about the money, right? Fishermen want to fish, right? So this is not a way to compensate out of a problem. This is an additional piece. If you can't avoid, if you can't minimize, if you can't mitigate, this additional avenue is available to you in this circumstance. However, there's all these other mechanisms that were raised about jobs and making sure communities can survive and how do we enhance and protect the working waterfront those are all other pieces of, of the equation as, as well so again this is not to say you know um so and so has a loss cut him a check and and he'll go away and we, we never have to see him again right this is really part of that overall package that we're talking about here and trying to to make sure that you know um through through the regulatory process right now, this is the mechanism to help address some of those those increased costs or, or losses, and and this is what we're working with. But this is by no means the end all be all solution here. Yeah, Morgan, those are really good points. Thank you for putting it in that bigger context. Eric. Up, oh, you're on mute, Eric. How about now? Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Eric Hingler from Hawaii Longline Association. Um, just, I, I guess, some some points I want to make about the recent discussion about, uh, I guess, this is not not the end all or solve all to the, the impacts directly on fishermen. <clears throat> I wanted to share some perspective um, that the, the fishing and, and seafood industry in the United States and domestic producers in particular are really uh facing unprecedented challenges right now and um it comes in many forms and it's uh i think offshore wind is is one of those areas that are are presenting you know huge challenges to to certain fisheries that compound and uh and increase the kind of cumulative impacts that producers are facing and those producers are facing serious challenges in the marketplace from unregulated subsidized foreign imports and rising production costs and government regulation and a sense that the United States government, the federal government, I'm not even speaking for the states, the federal government really is pushing fishermen to the side. Um, and so all of these things are kind of um, compounding in a way that I think you'll see as this further develops that the frustrations are only going to mount. And um, the point I want to make, you know, serving on this committee is that, you know, this is, is, is more than a death by a thousand cuts. Some of these are, are big open wounds that are facing uh, the, the nation's fisheries is certainly on the producer side that, um, you know, a fund here and there, while it could be helpful, um, it's not going to do it all. And we we know we're in a tough business, but we're also, we don't get the support like farmers do. The United States ag sector gets 20 plus billion a year in subsidies where seafood production gets very little. Um, and the, the kind of support and subsidies that my fishery gets here in Hawaii is basically on, on monitoring. You know, there's no, there's no fuel subsidy. There's nothing 
close to what the uh, the foreign uh, importers or, or fishery fleets are getting. So I want to just make those points um, while I had the opportunity and where we're discussing these funds and, and compensation. Um, there's a lot there's a lot going into the seafood production in the United States. And uh, this issue is, is just additive. And um, it, the frustration, I think, is going to grow. Thanks. No, thanks, Eric, for those. You know, um, again, this is... This is a difficult situation. I think we, the states, find ourselves in of trying to, you know, move offshore wind forward, but also protect our valuable um, resources and, and our communities. And you know, it's sometimes it's outside of our control over some of the things that you just raised. But I think capturing those in this process and this is the first time that we have eleven states working together on a challenging issue. And, you know, I would just ask the fishermen to think about that and think about how we can use this potential model to address some of the other issues you raised, right? You now have a body that's that's working together and, you know, through this engagement process for compensation, you know, I would just encourage folks to raise things and we will try to capture them and they may be outside of scope, but Again, right now you have 11 states that have an ear to the ground, and that might not have happened um, if, if we weren't in this situation. So Lisa could go ahead there. Yeah, I think that's well said, Morgan and Eric. Thank you, you know, for raising those points. I really, really hear them. Um, and I, I think my, you know, my, my response is, is partly like, help us figure this out, you know, this is, this is tough. This is challenging. We're trying to move the ball forward, you know, fully acknowledge that we don't know all the issues that are facing the fishermen, but we're trying to move the ball forward and trying to, to do the best we can. But if you have recommendations on how to do this better, please, by all means, you know, give us, give us those ideas, give us those suggestions. And Ron quickly raised his hand, so did Steve. So we'll go to Ron. No, I think this has been a very good conversation because uh, I think Morgan gets it and Lisa's starting to get it, but it's, it's way more than the idea of compensating individual fishermen. That ain't gonna work. And I learned that from the vessel buyback programs that existed over the 50 years that I've been dealing with this. <clears throat> Eric summarized it pretty good. Fish, the fishing industry is confronting a lot of issues. Climate change is going to be altering the catch. Potentially wind farms are going to be altering the catch in ways we don't understand. And then there's regulatory change at, at all levels. And this affects the security of fishermen, their thinking. And uh, to build seafood resiliency, there's three things we have to do. And I've been pushing this from a scallop industry perspective, but it holds for all fisheries. One is we have to uh, increase and enhance the target fishery, in, in this case, scallops. Now, scallop and uh, the fishery, a $500 million fishery depends on natural recruitment. Wind farms are gonna alter recruitment patterns, but they might alter them in a way that we can make use of it and actually produce uh, scallop spat, increase survival, the use of offshore upwellers, lots of enhancement concepts that would actually increase scallop production. <clears throat> the second thing is to develop new fisheries. With climate change, we're seeing major shifts in, in fish stocks. And uh, there's a potential for new fisheries. And new fisheries also mean taking a mobile gear fishery and making it a fixed gear fishery that could fish within a wind farm. Um, so that's a fisheries development thing. And the third angle, there's a real increased market for, for monitoring programs. Not only monitoring wind farms, but monitoring climate change, monitoring fish stocks. And the government doesn't have enough money and enough big white ships like I used to drive around to do the sampling. So <clears throat> the solution is train the fishermen to do scientific sampling. And 
I found that, uh, you know, I've been pushing that angle is um, that that's another source of income now for the fishing vessels. So we don't have those big uh, foreign flag vessels or these Gulf of Mexico vessels coming up to New England to do surveys. If we could train the fishermen to do surveys, then a, a, a company that has under contract to a wind farm, um, <clears throat> it doesn't have to put five scientists on board a vessel, consequently needing a much larger vessel than, than the large vessels we have in, in the, um, the squid fleets, the scallop fleets, the offshore ground fish fleets. If you <clears throat> train a crew to do science, you only have to put one or two people on board. The wind companies could end up paying a lot less for monitoring programs and a lot more data could be collected. Uh, so there are things to be that can be accomplished, but we're not doing any of it. Okay. Uh, it's just that the focus is somewhere else. Uh, we've put in for, you know, grant money to try to develop training programs for, for fishermen, be, uh, workforce training. Uh, they're, you know, they're rejected. Um, so I, I think there are things that can be done, but I, I'm just worried about too much focus going into this compensation to individual fishermen. Um, and one final example is that the amount of funding available for compensation uh, is totally inadequate, totally inadequate. And in 2012, we had a scallop set in uh, what we call Nantucket Lightship West, which is about 10 miles to the east of the, the slew of uh, wind lease areas. That set was in an area smaller than one of the lease sites. It generated, in the course of three years, $520 million in landings. Okay. <clears throat> what if, in fact, the wind farms have a negative impact uh, on the settlement of scallops? And there are some people that are projecting that might be the case. Okay, we're talking compensation needs of $500 million, not, not the $1 million or $3 million that are being set aside. So that's why I think we need a totally different approach uh, than this uh, individual compensation program. We, we need to focus on seafood production, seafood resiliency. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Did you, anybody want to comment or we'll just go to Steve? Steve, why don't you jump in? Okay, yeah, thanks, Jim. I, I see on the agenda, uh, well, we're almost finished, but we should be uh, uh, discussing future potential meeting uh, meeting topics. So uh, could I do that? Sure. So, uh, uh, but before I do, you know, once again, uh, Ron beat me to the switch. So, uh, but he always uh, sets, really sets the stage for me. Um, <clears throat> from the perspective of the, the tribes on the West Coast, mitigation is not an option. And um, I, I, I hope you all understand well enough the importance of, of fishing to the tribes. It's not just their economy, it's, it's, it's part of the very fabric. And um, I mentioned I'm at the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Just about everyone, I don't know if they're all here, but probably the vast majority of the 26 tribes on the Pacific coast are here. Some of them have very minor fisheries uh, that are impacted by the fisheries uh, in the on the west coast uh, ocean fisheries, but it's so important they're they're all here for that, and um, so so again that's that's just not something that that can be done. I'll give you an example of of a failed uh, effort and. Um, that is on the Columbia River. You're all probably familiar with the dams on the Columbia River. And, and when they were constructed, it was done with total disregard for the tribes and their treaty fisheries. Even though uh, at least 30 years before Bonneville Dam was started, the Supreme Court had upheld the, the rights of the tribes fishing on the Columbia River. Uh, but it went ahead and uh, the dams were built. The damage was done. 
And now, nearly 100 years after the first dam went in, we're, we're dealing with the, the impact to the salmon resource. And the administration recently uh, signed an agreement with uh, two groups of tribes. One was the group of tribes above Grand Coulee Dam, which completely blocked uh, upstream passage of fish. And so $200 million has been dedicated to attempt to reintroduce salmon above Grand Coulee Dam. And then for the, the main stem tribes, the four treaty tribes on the Columbia River, there's a $1 billion settlement to attempt to restore wild salmon. So uh, they've been waiting for years, for decades, to have a remedy to their lost fish. And so no tribe is interested in going through that again and, and having to having to be be at the point where where mitigation is the only option. So I was looking at the three steps, the avoidance, minimize, and mitigate. You know, we really need to be at the avoidance stage. So um, my recommendation, Jim, is that we look at uh, the development of uh, pilot projects or a pilot project on the West Coast and possibly on uh, in the Gulf and on the Atlantic uh, that will give us uh, some real information on, on the impacts from the development of offshore wind energy. Um, I've been, I've been directly involved in this for, for three years. And, uh, my first question is what would be the cumulative impact by this? What would it do to upwelling? What would it do to, uh, spawning and, and, uh, uh, nursery areas of, of larval ground fish and salmon, uh, salmon smolts that go out into the ocean and what would it do with the, the migration and, you know, just a host of questions and, and none of those have been answered. And yet uh, we've gone from call areas in California to lease areas. Uh, and now we're, uh, Boehm is on the verge of uh, leasing areas off the Oregon coast. Fortunately, the National Marine Fisheries Service has uh, developed an offshore wind energy strategic science plan, but it, it'll take many, many years to get to those answers. And a lot of those can't be answered by, by just modeling. And it'd be very difficult to answer the, the question of what will be the impact at scale when we are at 20 or 25 gigawatts off of California and whatever uh, else is done. Uh, so. I, I think a pilot a pilot project would would be a good starting point. I can't speak for whether the tribes would agree to that, but um, the the way to to do that is to start uh, engaging and I don't want to use that word engaging, but to to get with the tribes and and reach consensus on how that can be done before it gets started. And that's, that's the, the root of the problem here is Boehm did not come to the tribes and um, uh, meet with them as, as co-managers, as sovereigns, as the, the co-owners of the resource and, uh, and work with them as true partners. But I think that would be an opportunity to kind of reset and, and do things the right way. So I, I think that the committee could uh, do a good job on putting something together. And I, I really recommend that. So uh, hopefully we could do that. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Steve. And just for all the committee members, yes, we've sort of blended in the, the two sessions, but I think it's been pretty valuable to have a conversation. And the goal of the meeting was never to actually define what that next meeting topic was, but really just add to the list that we already have. So. We will continue to do that after the meeting as we all think through uh, what we've heard and some ideas, et cetera. But I really appreciate those comments, Steve. Um, there's a, does anybody want to respond to what Steve said before moving on? Morgan? Yeah, I just, Steve, I just want to thank you for those comments on, on behalf of the tribals, tribal nations. Um, you know, that is a, a topic of how to, um, again, not the maybe not the right use of the word, but how to engage with the tribes about our process and what our process means and what it is and what it isn't. 
um, and and recognizing that um, as co-managers and being sovereign nations, you know, this is not meant to surplant any of those um, uh, actions or processes that you know are are sacrosanct uh, to to the, the tribes. Um, again, the the idea of this program is all fishermen, you know. So again, that is in context of what we're talking about here. Um, but again, this is, I think, as you raise, there's a lot of other issues that the the tribal nations are dealing with with offshore wind, um, and we just we. I'll just say we don't want to muddy the waters with those conversations, but we're open to having a dialogue about what this program is and what this program isn't to make sure that we can help educate as well. So I, I'll just leave that door open. Uh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you, David. Yes. Um, first of all, I, I want to go back and talk about the, um, the 11 states and um, their uh, collective um, work to resolve just a horrendous problem that's going to get worse, not better. And that is that, um, that the, there's not going to be enough money to help anybody uh, significantly. And there are gonna be a lot of folks who are going to, especially the inshore fishermen's relatively small boat fishermen, they will be in a situation where they uh, they will not be able to travel far enough to to be able to uh, compensate or fill in the compensation that they're losing by losing access to their traditional fishing grounds. And there's some classic examples of it. All you have to do is look at the chart. Um, so we need to to work on resolving the problem that that is obvious. And when you read the compens the compensation for the two existing companies that are operating wind farms uh, today, those those um, requests for information to cover compensation are, you need either uh, an accounting firm and a law firm, or at least an accounting firm. And if you're a small boat fisherman, you just can't afford it. You don't have the records. You don't keep all your catch records and precise um, locations where you caught all of that. And so they're just going to get aced out of the whole process. Uh, and so, we need to find a fairer, a more representative way. The big boats offshore are going to lose a lot of access to a lot of fishing grounds. Um, uh, the, the shellfish uh, scallops and the clam industry are going to have some very difficult decisions to make because some of the fishing grounds that, um, th that they are constantly use are going to be um, uh, populated with all these wind turbines. And and I can assure you that bo bottom tending mobile gear uh, dredges in particular are going to have a very difficult time, if not impossible to fish within because of all the cables. Even if the cables are buried deeply, sooner or later they're gonna get washed out and sooner or later, if somebody's trying to fish in there, they're going to be hung up in the power cables, and and that's going to be extremely dangerous for the vessel, the crews, and for the power company that owns the turbine. So we, as a committee, really need to uh, see if we can frame uh, an idea on our group of ideas on how to help this resolve uh, and. And hopefully, Bohm will get into it, uh, into the process by their suggested regulations in conjunction with the states, so that we have one um, one standard that everybody lives with, and that will 
make the whole process at least more fair. So thank you very much. Thanks, David. Does anybody care to respond directly to those comments? Okay, so um, looking at the time, it's amazing that we're actually on time very well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Morgan, Lisa, and Chris uh, for your time and effort uh, in the presentation and answering all our questions. And so um, why don't I hand it off to Brian for some closing remarks and then uh, Carolyn, I think, is going to go next. Thanks. Can everybody hear me okay? I had some headset issues uh, in the middle of uh, Dave's uh, uh, discussion there. So uh, apologies, Dave, that I missed, missed some of that, but I appreciate the, the comments. Um, but I, I will also note that I, I do appreciate the the entire uh, committees, uh, you know, coming together. Uh, you know, it's been a while since we've, um, we've met. And, um, you know, I think Yesterday was kind of a warm up. I think we did get into a good discussion today, and um, you know, I, I do really appreciate the feedback and the the transparency that this committee can bring to, you know, addressing some of these concerns that you raise, which I think are concerns that we do see reflected in in public meetings and and elsewhere, and allow that opportunity for you know a constructive dialogue around you know what we're experiencing and, and you know what we see uh on the ground and, and i think some of the things that both boehm and and boehm partners are, are doing to address some of those those issues obviously there's a lot more we can do and i'm looking forward to um you know digging into some of those a, a little bit more um you know in in future meetings so again uh just thank you very much for your your time and commitment to this and um and uh Look forward to, to next time. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Brian. And I want to say thank you to um, Chris and Morgan and Lisa uh, for joining us for the afternoon panel discussion. Um, <clears throat> we really, uh, I think, had a great dialogue going both um, earlier to this afternoon and then the, with the second panel discussion and a lot of good ideas for the committee to take and digest um, and discuss as we move forward with future meetings and thinking about how best um, we as a group from the National Academies can um, help to uh, provide advice to the team at BOEM um, and hear from you know everyone, all the different stakeholders uh, within the offshore wind energy and fisheries space I know uh, just a few logistical items. Um, there were some questions that uh, and comments that did not uh, address directly. Um, some of those I can get back uh, to individuals after the meeting closes um, and as we uh, kind of get some more information from some of our presenters, but um, tried to address as many as possible. And I think we had a good balance today um, hearing from the public. Appreciate your um, interest and your uh, sticking on the presentations today and and you know, providing questions and input um, that help to shape um, how we move forward as a committee and some of our next steps. Um, so uh, yes, there will be some follow-up with some of those open-ended questions. Um, also happy to uh, share in the, the uh, chat here with everyone, um, the webpage for the standing committee. Um, this is where we'll post updates on the uh, future meetings for this this group. Um, nothing is set yet for the next <clears throat> meeting, excuse me. <clears throat> um, but we will be sharing the recording of today's presentation um, and yesterday's presentation here later this week when we get that back um, and can post it uh, under the events page. Uh, also, just wanted to, to make sure everyone was aware on our National Academy's Offshore Wind Standing Committee webpage, you can see the committee's statement of task, um, and it is pretty broad, and um, we do have a, a really good working relationship, I think, with the, the Brian and the team at BOEM to help um, shape different meeting topics as we go forward and um, take input from um, different speakers we heard today as well as the the public um, and all of our committee members um, to make this group something that we can um, help 
uh, provide valuable advice um, as offshore and wind energy is continuing to develop and um, engaging with the, the fishing community. I think um, um, also just want to do one more plug um, on our webpage as well. If you did not uh, register or did not get an email from the National Academies about registering for this event, um, there is a spot to con or to receive more information. Um, so we would love for you to get on our our mailing list and get direct updates about the standing committee activity as we have future meetings planned, um, likely uh, summertime and fall. Um, for additional activities of the standing committee. And with that, um, Jim, do you have any final comments? Just to thank you and the Academy for the leadership and Brian, um, it's been really a valuable conversation and I really do appreciate Bohm's openness to hearing us and, and really uh, listening to what we have to say. Thank you. All right, with that, we will end a, a few minutes early. Um, have a great afternoon, everyone.